What's going on, everyone? How's it going? We're here again. Oh, I look, the camera's up there. I gotta remember the camera's up here. Turn that down. So what's going on? It's Thursday, May 13th. We're back again here on, on another beautiful night of cigars and coffee. So tonight has been the, the show we've been telling you a lot, a lot about over the last like couple months with the Aganorsa Leaf, Rare Leaf Reserva. We're going to have Mr. Mike King joining us in a little bit. And um, yeah, it's been a good time, exciting. One thing about this, this, uh, this music, it takes a long time and I'm like, oh my. All but almost done. There we go. Oh. All right, so how's y'all doing tonight? Thanks for tuning in. Really appreciate you being here. We're back again. It's Thursday, May 13th, and it's another really pretty day here in Baltimore. It's actually kind of a, it's seasonal, so meaning that it's like around seven, low 70s, upper 60s. It's going to be a little bit colder tonight, but overall, pretty darn nice for this time of year. And uh, so we're going to get right into it so we get, don't make Mike wait too long. Um, tonight's coffee, we're going to start off with our Sumaba from Costa Rica. This is a beautiful yellow honey process, which is what they call the Tunkey Point, which is a particular part of the farm on the southwestern edge of the farm. So this farm uh, is called Sumaba de Lourdes, and it's located in the Central Valley of Costa Rica, probably about an hour outside of San Jose. So if you've ever been to, uh, to, um, to Costa Rica and San Jose, it's actually, if you drive about an hour west, that's where the Central Valley is. And um, yeah, we've got this coffee, and it's really a lovely one. So we've got our clever brewer here. We're going to put this together. So this is the clever. The clever is a hybrid kind of coffee brewer, meaning that we're going to use an immersion, a full immersion like a French press, where you put the coffee in and you let it steep for three minutes. And then you, we're going to place this on top of our cup, and this valve here that's at the bottom will then open and allow the water to flow through. Now, the nice thing about this is that we actually are going to use the paper filter. So this is a regular Melita number two that you can buy pretty much anywhere. And you just kind of fold it a little bit along the seams to make it fit. We're going to put that in into the brewer. And we've got our ground coffee, medium ground coffee. This is uh, the Sumava, like I said. So we're going to put that in. Level it out a bit. Give you a little bit of light so you can kind of see what's going on in it. Right? Okay. Then we're going to add our hot water. Also, we're going to get our timer ready. Three minutes is on the timer, right? So we're going to add the water, start the time, and we're just going to let it fill, give it a little bit of fill, and then wait a moment while, it, while the coffee blooms. You know, the fresh roasted coffee needs a little bit of time to bloom because it starts to float. And if you don't knock off what's floating on top, that's coffee that just doesn't get any extraction and you don't really get any flavor out of it. And... If your water ratios are off, then you could get more sour, less brewed coffee. That's about a good enough time. We're just going to make sure that we saturate the water, all the, I mean, all the grounds with the water, and then come up to our volume. We're going to be adding about 350 milliliters of water, which will give us a 12-ounce serving. So this thing comes with the lid, so we're going to put that on the lid, and we're going to wait for this thing to brew up. So, let me, so this coffee that we're brewing today is the Sumava, and the Sumava is, let me pull it up here for you to see. So this is the Sumava, and this is a really, really lovely coffee. We sourced it from a guy named Francisco Mena. He's the, the producer down in Costa Rica. And, um, yeah, so it's from the 16... 1670 to 1790, so 1700 to 1800 liters of our sea level, which is a fairly high grown coffee, not the highest that we buy from. We normally 
The highest is actually from a place called Chiripov, which is this coffee that we get that's from about 2,200 meters, and that's really pretty hot. And this is a yellow honey katura. What that means, katura is the, the, the actual variety of Arabica coffee that we're using. And the yellow honey process means that we're pulping the coffee, we're removing the hull from the, the beans while leaving part of the mucilage, the pulpy matter, covering the beans and then drying it out in the sun. And so it's a, it's a really nice way to do it. It gives a little bit of tropical notes to it. Um, yeah, and so it's, it's been a really interesting, so it's really a crisp, citrusy, yuzu-y, honeysuckle kind of coffee. Well, those are the flavor I look for, and um, just really quite pretty. All right, so let's go back. We should almost be done. Yeah, we're about almost done here. So now what we're going to do is we're just going to take, after it's been brewing here, so like the French press, it sits in the water and immerses completely and then brews in about the last 10 seconds. Put that up here. And so we're going to use this beaker, and this beaker is going to open the valve. As you can see, it's flowing through, the valve is flowing through. So this will take about a, you know 30 seconds or so to brew. So we're looking for really a total brew time, about three minutes, 30 seconds to four minutes. Really will depend on how long it takes for it to flow through the, flow through the valve, through the filter, with the grindness, the fineness of the grind of the coffee. We're going to finish. How are we doing here? Let me see if I can't really see on the screen. Oh, there it is. About three, 350 mil. We're about 320 mil, 30 mils, 340 mils. All right, there it is. For about three, what are we now? 300, almost 350 mils. Not just, oh, right on the money. 350, excellent. <laughs> Not bad for an old guy. All right, so that's the, our coffee for the day. That's the Malvo. And we're going to put that into our nice little mug here. And let's give it, see how it turns out. So it's got some nice tropical notes on the aroma. It's still a bit hot. Oh, but nice, nice citrusy, nice clean kind of finish. Oh. All right, so that's our coffee we're going to be drinking today. Let us call over here now to Mr. Mike King and see how he's doing tonight. Mike, how are you? Hey, I'm doing fantastic, brother. Thanks for having me on this evening. Thanks for coming on. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Great yeah. Coffee. Yeah, I'm uh, just... Great. I'm in Pittsburgh right now. I'm actually at the famous uh, Leaning House Cigar Lounge. I'm, uh, Dave Puskovic has been gracious enough to let me do the uh, podcast from here. So Fantastic. if you've never been to Pittsburgh, it is the Cigar City. you got to come up here, hit me up anytime. I'll tell you all about it. So, all right. Actually, yeah. Cirillo McLean's always talking really highly about the Pittsburgh scene. Oh, yeah. You, you definitely got to check it out. All right, I will, I will definitely have to make it up there, make it up there. Yeah. So tell David we said thank you very much for letting you come join us from his shop. I definitely will. All right. So tonight we're doing the, the really preserved. But first of all, before, you've been with Aganorsa now for how long? Uh, I've been with Aganorsa now for, uh, well, a year and a half, uh, technically, on the books. I was working for a uh, wholesaler cigar distributor. Before that, and the uh, reason they hired me is because I was passionate about Aganorsa, and I was selling quite a bit of their product for three years before that point. <laughs> oh wow! Okay, okay. So yeah. you were working as so you're working as you're working as a broker, not actually. Uh, uh, right. So I'm their I'm their broker. It's a pretty easy job because they're the only people I broker for. Okay. So I uh, I work the entire Mid Atlantic. So from Washington D.C. 
uh, all of PA, all of Jersey, all of Maryland, obviously, and uh, my home state of Delaware. Oh, nice. Now, how does that how does that differ than being a manufacturer rep? Is that right? Is that so. Yeah, I, I was actually really confused when I started this game. Uh, what well, that was, I didn't even heard of a broker before for cigars. So the difference is, uh, just like any company that you work for, uh, when you work for directly for a manufacturer, like Agnors actually does have direct reps. Uh, so we have, uh, I, I don't know the exact numbers. I think we have three direct reps and the rest of our sub brokers. So the direct rep, uh, you're on salary. Uh, they pay you for everything. Uh, you're dedicated just to that. And so, um, but as a broker, uh, companies use brokers because normally brokers are already settled in that territory. It's a place they want to grow. And it's not as expensive because they don't have to have somebody actually on salary all the time. So you're paying, all they're doing is paying out a commission instead of a full salary. Oh, I see. Okay. Ah, nice. And so you've been, you've been, you've been, Yes, so I've been. Uh, we signed a contract in January of 2020 in Nicaragua, um, and then I uh, really got strong. You know, then all of a sudden COVID hit. So, you know, from June till now, it's been fantastic. Is there a time no. thing, or is that yeah. perpetual? Uh, it's perpetual. Um, so I honestly uh, don't know all the details because I do work for the same wholesaler slash distributor. Um, so I work for an umbrella company. So my boss um, has a cigar lounge in Philadelphia, and he also owns a wholesale slash distributor. And his third company is the brokerage company, which I am the one and only employee of the brokerage company. Oh, okay. Okay, gotcha. gotcha. Yeah. Right on, right on. All right, so yeah. tell us, what, what do we need to know about Aganors? Uh, there's quite a bit, actually. So uh, Aganors has been around for about 20, 25 years. Um, what I get from a lot of people is they've never heard of you. I said, well, yeah, you have. Um, and you definitely have smoked our product. And I say that because uh, all the way up to about three years ago, we were Casa Fernandez. So, uh, Casa, yeah, so Casa Fernandez is an old name, uh, named after the owner of our company, Eduardo Fernandez. So, um, Eduardo, are you still there? I think I lost you. Hello. Crazy, eight. I lost you somehow. Are we back on? So, uh, so I don't know if we have technical difficulties here or if it's on my end. I tell you what, if anybody can see or hear me, text me, 843-822-6769, 843-822-6769. Uh, let, me, uh, let me see what we can do here.
All right, I think. <laughs> God, sorry, everyone. This has been crazy. Okay, I think we're back. Sorry about that. I had a bit of a. I don't know what happened. I think we, we had a bit of a, a technical issue on my end. Hopefully, Mike, you're seeing this and call back, Mike. <laughs> Sorry, my gosh, everything's a little bit crazy today. Let me see if we can recall Mike back here. My goodness. Anyway, so here we are again. It's a beautiful night here in Baltimore. I guess we didn't lose the signal, which is good. Oh, there we are. Let me call him. Let's see what Mike has to say. Hey, man. Okay, so I, I, I think I, I've got it reconnected. All right. And um, are you still connected to the to the to the stream? Hold on a second. Ah, gotcha, gotcha. All right, here we go. Here we go. All right, excellent, excellent. All right, Mike. Sorry about that. All right. Sorry about the technical difficulties, folks. Uh, my apologies. I was, I was trying to reconnect this drive, and I think I hit something that disconnected the camera itself. Oh, wow. So, we're so, back now. Uh, we're, we're, we're <laughs> all right. Now, can you hear me okay? Yeah, can you hear me at all? Uh, very quiet. <laughs> very quiet. Very I got my volume all the way up. Is that any better? better? Nah, it's the same. It's the same. Hmm. How about now? It's the same thing, bro. Hang on there for a moment. Let me read. Let me see if I can read. Here. Yeah, sure. I'm hanging. Did that change anything? No, I can hear you. It's the same thing. Let me reconnect. Okay. Man, sorry about all the troubles. <laughs> all right. How's that better? Perfect. Yeah, that's how we used to fix airplanes back in the day. Restart them. Yeah. Did you fix? Did you work in airplanes before? Yeah, I'm retired Air Force. Oh, what kind of aircraft did you work on? Uh, I started on a C-141 cargo plane. I worked a U-2 spy plane for a couple of years. I uh, worked in uh, Russian helicopters with Afghans, flew with them, and I retired on a C-17 cargo plane. It was, oh, it was a great nice. adventure. Nice. Yeah. One of my one of my friends from a long time ago. He's a uh, I, I think he might just be getting ready to retire. He's also, he does something with the Globemaster as well. Oh, no kidding. Yeah, I might know him. He's out in Honolulu, a guy named um, Danny Hiyama. Don't know him, but I'm sure I know a lot of people that do. All right, right on, right on. So oh, here's a question for you, since you said you're on the, yeah. you're on the YouTube, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I saw a video or this, this blurb where they were talking about when the plane lands, you guys have to go run the mm -hmm. Is that for real? Yep. So what oh, do yeah. you do? So, uh, so when the, the, the pilot on the U-2, uh, actually, they go above the atmosphere. So they wear the same kind of spacesuit that NASA does. So when they land, uh, because his field of vision is so limited when he's coming down, they have a uh, – well, now they probably – I think they use – BMWs now, but when I was there, it was a chase car with a, a Mustang 5.0, and uh, 
And so we would be behind a Mustang. So the guy, the pilot, would be telling them left, right, 10 feet, 9, 8, 7, helping them land. And then when he finally landed, uh, we would pull up uh, right behind him a truck. And one of the wings would be uh, fuel heavy. And that would be on the ground. The other wing would be up in the air. So we actually had to go grab the wing, pull it down, put some wheels on it, and guide it all the way in. Did that every day. So, and if, when the wheels didn't fit, we, so when the wheels didn't fit, we'd actually have to jump on the wing and ride the wing in to keep it balanced. Whoa. So you're actually yeah. driving at speed trying to do this? Uh, no, we wait till we'll, we chase him down and he'll come to a stop or he or she will come to a complete stop. And then one of the wings will just tilt left or right. to the, And then when they're finally stopped, we go to the wing that's up and we level it out. So he can go in. Uh, gotcha, gotcha, it was the most gotcha. most exciting two years of my career. <laughs> That's amazing. Like I saw, oh, yeah. I saw, I saw that video once with um, that guy from Top Gear. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the footage they brought back just looked oh, yeah. incredible. incredible. Amazing. Oh, yeah. Amazing. All right. So let's get into Aganorsa. Tell, me, tell us. Sure. We've got, we've got our cigar, which is the... You got the rare leaf? I got the rare leaf from Tobacco Leaf. Wonderful. So, Raul's been our very uh, special friend here in this whole endeavor. So we Good. Got from him and, uh, so, this is a, the rare leaf reserve is a limited release. Is that correct? Or limited uh, uh, Yes and no. Okay. Um, so, it is limited only to certain select retailers. So uh, Raul is one of our very few select retailers in the entire Mid-Atlantic that can carry that rare leaf. Oh, wow. So, which means uh, he will be carrying it all year through the entire year. Mm -hmm. And uh, so you can get that at any time at Tobacco Leaf. And uh, it is, so you cannot buy that anywhere else oh, wow. unless they're a select retailer. Now, what makes so, a retailer become a select retailer? Um, so we have, uh, like Raul, for example, at Tobacco Leaf. Um, he's been a very long-time supporter of our product, back when we were Casa Fernandez, turning over to Aganorsa Leaf. And um, so uh, the retailer has an opportunity to buy a little bit more product than they're used to buying. And that will qualify them for uh, getting special products. So they'll get more boxes. So we have the Supreme Leaf I'm sure you're familiar with. So that gives the retailer the, uh, the advantage to get uh, at least 15 boxes of the Supreme Leaf versus uh, zero to five with the others. And then uh, and this year was unique where we released a cigar specifically just for those uh, select retailers. Yeah. It's been a big hit, a bigger hit than we thought it was going to be. Yeah, because I was reading on, um, I was reading an article out there from Half Wheel that was talking about how the, uh, the, the leaf is short supply leaf, is that right? Yeah, so, um, so we have enough to supply just our select retailers, and we will have enough to supply continually. Oh. So uh, but the difference is that specific leaf for that wrapper that's used, the filler, it comes from a specific farm uh, where, uh, like, a certain small area. So it's kind of like a small batch. So uh, it's not going to go away. We'll continue to have it, um, but it's just limited in numbers. And I can, you know, as we go, I'll tell you a lot more about it. I actually, uh, I personally believe that's the best cigar they've ever made. Oh, I'm looking forward to trying it then. Oh, yeah. Now, for the, the cigar pack that we talked about with uh, Raul, with, uh, to the two Fumas. Yes. The, um, so, should, how should, should we progress with the Fumas first or the cigar first? I, I highly recommend do the Fumas first. Okay. So, so we've got uh, I, yes, you do have two of them. C99. So, uh, I will tell you uh, a little, little backstory on them real quick. Uh, when we changed the name from Casa Fernandez to Aganorsa Leaf, uh, we did that because uh, we wanted to set ourselves apart, let people know 
that we are known for our leaf. Uh, a lot of people don't know we're actually the largest landowners in Nicaragua. We also do cattle and pig farming. And so, um, but what we are really known for is uh, we have, uh, we sell our, our product, our, our leaf, to a lot of manufacturers that you smoke probably every single day, including Patron, Fuente, Drew Estate, many more. So, uh, getting back to the Fumas, to be able to have people experience the Fumas or to experience our leaf, we decided to bring the farm to you. So, uh, now I lost your video. Are you still there with me? Yes, yes, I'm still there. Okay, perfect. So, um, so, we have three prominent farms in Nicaragua. So, we have Jalapa, which is in the northernmost valley of Nicaragua, right on the other side of Honduras, on, on the other side of the mountains. We have Candega, and then we have Esteli. So, most people are familiar with Esteli because that's where most of the people are in this industry. So, the C99 that you have in your hand, uh, that's the one that you're going to smoke first. That is uh, Corojo 99. A lot of people grow Corojo 99. It says Cuban seed. Uh, what's unique about it is um, the, uh, there was a time in the uh, late 70s, early 80s where Cuba uh, had their product. Uh, it was decimated by what they called the blue mold. So the answer to that blue mold was to regrow their Corojo, and they made this Corojo 99. So Eduardo Fernandez, uh, the owner, uh, he flew to Cuba and bought as much seed as they'd sell them. And he also hired their botanists, their farmers, the agriculturists, and brought them to Nicaragua. Uh, we actually brought the bean over, believe it or not. So okay. um, so that Corojo 99 was the answer. So that's grown a Jalapa. So that Corojo 99 is uh, what you want to light up first. Uh, keep in mind, it's just a leaf. So what we did is uh, from seed to production floor, we grab the leaf right before it goes on the rolling floor, and uh, their rollers make those uh, for me to bring to you. So it's a finished leaf, leaf only, that before it goes into binder, filler, wrapper. Okay. So I say that, keep in mind, because it will draw very fast. Okay. When I don't give that warning, uh, people will, will uh, get a little bit upset with me. So right off the bat, um, this is why we do that. You get that slight bite of pepper mm -hmm. right on the tip of your tongue. Right there, yeah. So uh, that's that's what it's known for. That's why people buy that leaf for us, because of that quality of that pepper. But what's most unique about that seed, that leaf is the seed has a quality uh, characteristic that actually makes you salivate. So what happens eventually is you start salivating out of the uh, sides of your cheeks. And then and eventually what happens is in turn that makes it sweeter. So it's like a pepper sweet. Okay. Now, when I do these tastings all the time, I do them every day. I tell people, listen, everybody has a different palate. And you can tell me it tastes like grandma's apple pie. That's fine. I don't care. Uh, what I'm describing, though, is the characteristics of the leaf. Right. So uh, which is important. So a lot of people say, hey, I don't have time to smoke that. I said, listen, it only takes three minutes because all you need to do is spend one minute on it. Most people, after the experience, they end up smoking them all night anyway. But just to pick it up and to describe it, um, so that is, uh, I wouldn't say we have a monopoly on it necessarily, but uh, we do uh, grow quite a bit of it, and uh, that is what we're known for, is that Corojo 99. So the Corojo, 99, but, the Corojo is the, the, bridal, the variety of tobacco, is that correct? Yes, so Corojo 99 is the variety type. Uh, I, when I first started, I was under the impression, like a lot of people ask me, is that the year? Uh, no, it's not the year. <laughs> it's, uh, just the label Corojo 99. So, so it's been around, Corojo 99 has been around for 20 years. Okay. Is, do you know, like, so like in, in the coffee business, we have different varietals of coffee. That makes mm -hmm. similar, similar details where they'll have a number. And like, like you said, the numbers really aren't about the year. Right. The designation. And so are these lab developed numbers? Is that, would that be the right I, uh, I'm not a bullshitter, so I'll tell you, I do not know the answer to that question. But I can find out for you. Yeah. I appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, that's, uh, actually, that's the first, first time somebody's asked me that, so I, I, I'm going to find out. Yeah, yeah. So we have a, a lot of different, uh, in, in coffee, there's like, 
a lot of copies will come out with different numbers, like um, mm -hmm. like a like a Scott one eighteen, and the one eighteen is right. just yeah. the number of the varietal from the Scott lab. Mm -hmm. and so sure. I'm just curious. Yeah. So the seed, the the Coropo ninety nine. The, it's from Halapa, so the, the, the terroir will have a different impact. Yes. So seed. the most prominent that you get from is the seed. And then, of course, the soil has something to do with that. I mean, now talking about coffee. Um, so Halapa is a, about a three hour drive from Esteli up. And as you drive it up, you can actually smell and see the difference. So um, the soil kind of gets reddish and a little bit drier. And I noticed on my first trip up there, I asked, uh, you know, uh, Terrence, who was riding with us, Terrence Riley, who's the director of the company, you know, what am I looking at here? And uh, so he said, all those little plots you see in people's yards, you know, those are all coffee, actually, plots. So that territory in Jalapa is very famous for coffee. So um, the uh, so the soil definitely does have a uh, contribution to the flavor that you taste. So, oh, okay. but I, I, I say that because I don't want to take away from the con uh, from what the characteristics of that tiny little, you know, smaller than a grain of sand seed does. Yes, yes, yeah. The, the seeds are surprisingly small. Oh yeah, it's almost like dust in your hands, almost. Yes, yes. I've, I've seen them on, on visits to to, mm -hmm. to different farms. Are the um. So when we talk about this halapa miso, it has that pepperiness. Is this really where a lot of that peppery note that the, the Robinson comes from? Or yes. Yeah. Well, I when when I do now, because everybody's different. Um, I go back in time. I've been smoking cigars for twenty seven years. Okay. So, um, what what this brings me back to is it's reminiscent of me of Cuba. First time I'd ever had a Cuban cigar, I can actually taste Cuba through that Carajo 99. It brings me back to that first time I lit up, I think it was a uh, Monte Cristo number two um, that I had. I was stationed in Korea. That's where I bought it. And um, so it takes me back to that nice, but not overpowering pepperness, that, you know, subtle, you know, flavor and how it balances out. So, um, I would attribute more of the Nicaraguan flavor to the second one that you're going to try, and you'll see why when you try it. Okay. Is that something and, you should try now? Or? Yeah, you should try it now. Okay. So, uh, one, yeah. one more question with this. It's, sure. It says, it says here, viso. The viso is the, the part of the leaf. Is that the, the it's the part of the leaf. So, I tell people often, um, so, I mean, what we're known for, like I said, we sell quite a bit of our, t our tobacco to people. A majority of what we use for our own growth and everything is from the piso from the middle part of the plant. We rarely ever use anything from the top of the plant, Lajero, with one exception. Uh, and I can go through that a little bit later. We do have one specific cigar we sell, the signature line, that uses what's called the media tiempo, which is, grows on top of the Lajero. Oh, okay. okay. Yes. Which shameless plug, Raul has that as well at Tobacco Leaf. <laughs> Excellent. Well, we're all mm -hmm. for shameless plugs here. So. Mm -hmm. All right, so we're going to try this from the C98, the VC. Mm -hmm. So the C98, uh, this one is the Criollo 98. The Criollo 98 is grown uh, in our farms in Esteli, three hours south of Palapa. Okay. Um, this, really I'm a little biased. Yes, I'm biased because I like this a lot. Now, when I said... What takes me back to reminiscence of Nicaragua? This takes me to Nicaragua. Wow. This takes me to the first time I picked up a Nicaraguan cigar. It's got that right off the bat. It's got that earthiness to it. Um, I've heard different descriptions. You can describe it any way you want. I've heard leathery. I've heard rosy. I've heard uh, floral. I've heard all kinds of different descriptions. The most important takeaway of this is absence of the pepper. So... Uh, it doesn't have the bite of the pepper at all. Now, just like the seed on the Corojo 99 had the characteristic that made you salivate, this seed as well has a very unique characteristic. Uh, very soon, uh, on the tip of your tongue, on the roof of your palate, you're going to get a subtle uh, salt, kind of saltiness. Oh, 
yes. You know, so right. There's that, sure. yes. So that is a characteristic. Now I tell people all the time. So when people are buying our tobacco, the buyers, which it's got to be the best job in the world. Um, so they'll go and they'll pull a peel on and they'll do exactly what you're doing right now. They will smoke it and they will bear it, be validated to make sure it has those qualities that you're tasting right now. So, and that's why so many people buy that tobacco from us because of that unique characteristic. The so, is really amazing. yes. Oh, yeah. It's, uh, uh, and I like this because when you get to that rare leaf, um, uh, not just a rare leaf, but everything that we make um, has the Corojo and the Criollo in some form or fashion, binder, filler, wrapper, the ratio, it all has the Corojo Criollo. Um, so you will also, I, I did mention this earlier, but uh, we make a lot of brands for different people. So we make all of Illusion cigars. We make uh, HBC cigars. We make VI cigars. Uh, we make uh, Warped cigars guardian of the farm we actually we actually deliver and um even foundation we made the first cigar the uh uh the wise man so yes so um i say that to say that now when you pick up when you go back to Louisiana or any of those brands i just mentioned you're going to taste that corojo and that criollo now you never forget it it's a taste that you will never forget so it comes to me a little bit salty, but more really like a, a bright, acidic, spicy yes. kind of mm -hmm. on it. Really yep. Good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, what I'm smoking right now, I'm smoking our Lunatic Maduro. Okay. And uh, the reason I like our Maduro is because I favor the Criollo, which is smoking right now. I just have, so our Maduros, uh, we use, uh, for most of the Maduros, we use a San Andreas wrapper on it. Um, However, uh, in our filler, we have a, it's very Criollo heavy. So it balances out the bitterness of the San Andres. And uh, that's why I love it. I love the taste of that. So uh, now you want to make sure that Corojo 99 is still hot. because you still got a flame and a fire on it. Because uh, what I want you to do is I want you to grab both of those. And I want you to smoke them both at the exact same time. So this, that's why we do that. I call that the O-Face, you know, when I'm doing this. I get the same reaction every single time. So basically, in its simplest form, you just made a cigar. So uh, so you can see how the pepperness of the Carajo, the saltiness, earthiness, uh, uh, citrusy of the Criollo, how they perfectly balance each other. Yeah, exactly, exactly. That's what I was just thinking, wow. And it's almost like now, obviously, I'm not a roller. I'm not Latin. I'm Irish. I, everything I've learned, I've learned from uh, the company, Terrence Riley, and, I, and uh, you know, combined with my passion for this industry. Um, but I will say that uh, it's kind of like a baseline. So when you have that, that now, if you want a little bit more pepper, or you want a little bit more of this or that, that's when you start introducing other things into the, the actual cigar. So, yeah, and that's where I'm at, rollers. So, uh, and I tell people this a lot of times as well. It doesn't matter if you're in the Dominican Republic or you're in Ecuador or Honduras or Nicaragua, any company in any cigar company, anything that you see in every uh, humidor you run into, every company has master blenders. They utilize master blenders. And these master blenders, their only job in life all day long, I'm simplifying a bit. I mean, they do obviously a lot more, but uh, they'll go through 20, 30, 40 of those, you know, through the day from different farms, different fields, different countries, different ages. And they'll keep trying different ones until they have that perfect blend. And they say, all right, this is it. This is going to be our 2021 release. So that's how the cigar is born. Yeah, you know, it's, it's interesting you say that because we, um, I was able to visit the, uh, the Tabsa factory several years ago. Yes, that's us. And um, the, uh, all right, let's see if I can pull this up here. There's a, I've got an image to share with everyone. I'm thinking yeah. about that. Uh, 
So like you were saying, we were in the, uh, the tasting room there. I don't know if you there it is. Yeah. Yes. And um, this was back when Ramos was still around. Yes. And we were, you know, we got to see how they were, you know, like, like you said, they're rolling to these, they, these tobaccos together, making like sample cigars, tasting them. And it was really, really a fascinating, wonderful experience. There. Yeah, it is quite an experience. Um, I recommend... Uh, a good friend of mine, I, I'll, I'll call his name out, uh, uh, Dan Wood, who uh, works at the Wooden Indian up in uh, around Philadelphia. He told me years ago when I started this business, he said, Mike, I got to tell you, you are brought to a completely different level when you visit a factory. Um, and you never, and every visit after that, it's like the first visit all over again because you learn so much more. Uh, you never stop learning, and uh, you know this. You were there. I encourage everyone to do a factory tour uh, wherever you can get it. There's a lot of, uh, you know, I got, uh, I haven't been on them yet, but I've heard a lot of good things about them. Uh, uh, Perdomo has a great factory tour. I heard he's, his is the most educational. Uh, I haven't been on it, but I've heard quite a bit that you will, it's like a college class. You will learn quite a bit. Uh, there's some in the uh, Dominican Republic you can go to the same thing. So if you have an opportunity, uh, jump on it. I mean, I, I can foresee for sure, you know, with COVID and the vaccines and everything, you know, knock on wood, that 2022 is going to be a really good year for factory tours. Oh, I bet. I bet. Yeah, it's a, it is a definitely a wonderful thing to do. And one of the nice things for me is that, that made it easier is that since I, we buy coffee from Nicaragua, which we, we actually buy coffee mainly from this mm -hmm. And that's about right. an hour south or kind of south, southeast of mm -hmm. Esteli. So it's quite mm -hmm. really easy to get there. So it, it's, been, it's always right. a nice time. Yeah, next time you go, let me know. All right. I'm actually, uh, yeah, I actually, uh, you know, I'm shameless plug out there again. Uh, I'm hoping to go next year from between January and March. Uh, I'd like to extend my time there and go on with a few people and rent a house down south, you know, right there on the beach. So, There's some beautiful beaches there. yeah, whoever wants to go in on it, let me know. Um, I'm all about it. <laughs> I might take you up on that. I, I have yeah, man, absolutely. House. Yeah. Because especially March, January, March, that's yeah. coffee business. That's the harvest time. In, uh, in, in, yep, that's what I was told when I was there. Yep. Yeah, yeah, really great, really great. Mm -hmm. All right, so I guess we should get into this, the Rare Leaf Reserve. Yes. Let's get this one and go. That's a nice, beautiful, nice wrapper. Look at that. Yeah. Silky yes, uh, the, the wrapper. Um, so with this cigar, uh, I was talking about it had what Terrence calls it a cafe wrapper, uh, which means they came from a, that small plot of land. Um However, you still will have the Carajo and the Criollo in it. You'll taste it. Mm -hmm. um, one thing you'll notice about this, and which is why I like it so much, it's very Criollo, the C98, Criollo dominant. Uh, so you still will taste that Carajo, but it'll be very dominant on that earthiness, and it smooths out. I think it's a very, very well-balanced cigar. All right. My... Uh, you know, people ask me all the time, what's my favorite cigar? Well, now, obviously, it's a rare leaf. Uh, what do I smoke every day? Uh, oh, as far as the next one, I would say is well-balanced like that. Uh, Guardian of the Farm. I smoke the Guardian of the Farm, the small ones, the Rambo, the originals, every single morning for breakfast. Okay. And uh, if I could, if I had enough of it, I would smoke, uh, I would finish my day every single day with a rare leaf. Uh, well, I mean, the Guardian, to start the day with the Guardian of the Farm, that's a pretty... That's a great cigar to start with. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Terrence Riley got me on that. Uh, I, first time I rode with him, uh, first thing in the morning, he does that. That's his cigar every single morning. First cigar is uh, Guardian Farm. So uh, he got me on that. So uh, I actually buy a couple boxes just for myself every month. Nice. So, nice. Yeah. So now Terrence is the – he runs Agamorsa now? Uh, so Terrence uh, – yeah, so Terrence was hired. Uh, Terrence has a unique story. Um, if you saw him, you wouldn't even guess it. Um, you can't miss him. He's six foot giant to me because I'm I'm short. I'm five six. So 
Um, Terrence, uh, uh, as as tall and white as he looks, he's actually half Cuban. Uh, so uh, khaki slacks and golf shirt and all. So uh, his uncle uh, is a name that most people will be familiar with is Manuel Casada from Casada Cigars. Yes. So he cut his teeth at a very young age on the farms in the, D- in the DR. Uh, so after uh, he went to college and taught school for a couple of years, his uncle called him and said, hey, you want to come work for me? So he came down and he became the, uh, the face of uh, Casada. And uh, so uh, when Eduardo was seeing the shifting and everything, uh, they, they uh, reached out to Terrence for uh, employment. They wanted to do something different. So Terrence flew down there. He wasn't planning on getting a job, but he went down there. He's, uh, I think the cigar he told me he picked up was a Buena Cassecha, which is a very spicy Carol cigar. And um, he said that sold him. And so, so his role um, changes every time you talk to him. <laughs> um, he is uh, best because he, does, he t- he's pretty much everything. He, he, the, but I would call him the director of the company. His official title is he's the uh, the national sales and marketing director for the company. So uh, yeah, so Terrence is truly the face of the company, and uh, he's. I, I admire him immensely. He, uh, uh, the what he has done with these Fumas, that was his idea. The change to Agonor, so that was his idea. Uh, the Rare Leaf was his idea. The Supreme Leaf was his idea. So uh, he is, uh, he's very forward thinking. Uh, he's uh, very, very articulate and planned. And I, I tell him all the time, I wouldn't want his job for anything in the world just because he'll pick up the phone if you call him and act like that's, you're the only priority he has for the whole day meanwhile he's probably got five thousand other people trying to call him at the same time so uh yeah so if you ever have a chance to see terrence in your area when he comes down and obviously uh next time he's down uh he'll be down in june actually second week of june i'll announce okay. the tobacco leaf I'll let you guys know we'll come down and say hello to everybody oh that'd be great that'd so be great. yeah so with, with terrence now in in position so what what does eduardo and paul do uh, so Paul, Are they just kind of hanging out in Miami enjoying life? no, they're, they're still working their ass off. Um, okay. so Paul pretty much runs the entire, um, office down in Miami. So, uh, we are in Miami now. Don't ask me where, cause I'm not familiar. I, I get mixed turn around on Miami, but I know it's kind of a little bit Northeast of the, uh, the airport. Okay. If you blink, you'll miss us. Uh, we don't have anything fancy. There's not a giant Aganorsa billboard. There's not a, beautiful brick building or anything we're in an industrial area just uh the main purpose of this warehouse is just to bring product in and ship it out uh however uh saying that paul's the boss there and there's a reason uh we actually have four cuban ladies that uh work there every day um so they are in our back office and their only job is to roll cigars blend and roll cigars all day every day so with our Agonorsa series, if you've ever seen the Agonorsa leaf, like those are made in Miami. Uh, if you've seen our our uh, anniversary series, those are made in Miami by those ladies. Uh, the uh, the actual Casa Fernandez series made in Miami. If it says Miami on it, it's made in Miami. Uh, what's unique about that is, and you've been to the factory, so you've seen it. It's almost like a uh, every cigar factory you go to. It's you know, you have pairs of two, you know, two people at one table, two people at another table. They're working on a specific part of the cigar. They pass it on to the next table. Uh, the traditional Cuban way to make a cigar, they call them torcedors. Uh, you make a cigar from start to finish one person. So there's no passing it on to the next person. That's what's unique about this tobacco. So uh, to pull a statistic completely out of my ass, uh, I would say that uh, we pretty much send the top 1% of our tobacco to Miami. That's already been inspected through and through uh, to Miami for these ladies to make those cigars that are on your shelf. And the most beautiful thing about it is uh, retail wise, they're about the same price as everything else we sell. Okay. Yes. So, yes. Yeah. That's. Uh, you said there's only four ladies that are making mm-hmm. cigars in Miami? Yeah. And, I mean, that seems like a lot of production. It is. 
It's uh, it's fascinating. It's absolutely fascinating. Um, I would have, before I did this, uh, one background I didn't tell you while I was in the Air Force for 20 years, uh, between deployments, I deployed 13 times. Between deployments, wow. I worked part-time in cigar shops. So uh, I even worked under the table for cash in Korea, IRS. I hope you're not listening. Um, so the uh, uh, so I love cigars, like a lot of people that are listening to this podcast. Uh, but I had no idea, absolutely zero idea, how this all operated. I didn't know anything. So um, it's pretty cool to learn that there's so much that goes uh, behind the cigar that you buy from your shop. You know, uh, so, so much passion has been into what you, I mean, even before it's put in, you know, the rolled form, um, it's, it's fascinating to see people pick these leaves up and stretch them out and inspect them and then have another person inspect them on top of that. Then a third person inspect it just to make sure that leaf is perfect before it's rolled. Because um, it's, an, it's, a, it's an art. It's an absolutely beautiful thing to see. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know if you can see the screen, but I'm putting up for the viewers. Mm -hmm. um, these are images that I took when, during our visit to mm -hmm. the Tabsa factory. So really, we were there when we were there, uh, Dion happened to be in town. Oh, nice. That's why you see him. Like, you'll see him here in a couple of these images. Yeah. Yeah, there he is right there. Nice. So have you, you have you been to the factory yet yourself? Or? Uh, yes. Uh, I was invited there January when we went down there. Um, to where I met Eduardo for the first time. Oh, okay. um, uh, he picked us up in Managua. I was expecting a... Uh, a man in a nice suit and a nice car and you name it. Um, he is absolutely the most uh, outside of uh, the only person I've met that's similar to him was I met uh, Jose Padron many years ago uh, in, in Miami. I had a one-on-one -on -one with him. Uh, Jose, uh, Eduardo Fernandez is a very humble person. Um, he, I mean, if you didn't know what he looked like, you would think he's working at the factory. You just, I mean, he doesn't have a fancy office, nothing like that. So uh, I was impressed from start right off the bat. Um, and then I was fascinated. We, we took the ride up to SLE. And then uh, the next day we took the Jalapa. He, t he gave us uh, a uh, tour and explained everything where we're going. And uh, the man is extremely busy. And I was very uh, fortunate to be able to spend that time with him over uh, about three or four day uh, period. Yeah, because mm -hmm. Eduardo's got a lot of different business lines that he's involved in. Is that correct? Is that correct? He does. If you uh, you could probably dig deep into some old podcasts and some old YouTube videos. Uh, and recently, I think, uh, just to let you know, uh, we do have a YouTube video channel now for Aganorsa. Uh, I'll send it to you. Um, okay, the uh, but uh, you can listen to old old programs where his story. You could probably read some off the Hot Wheel and a few other blogs. Uh, Eduardo Story, he's, uh, he's Cuban-American, uh, went to school and went to college. Uh, him and if I remember right, I'm pretty sure I got the story correct, uh, he and his brother, they moved to Europe. They started, uh, I think it was a pizza company in Europe. Yes, yes, that's right. And uh, so when they sold, uh, their, they went uh, public, sold their shares, and I think Eduardo's uh, portion was like over 70 million something. So uh, Eduardo always had a passion for farming. So he took his money and he bought a lot of land in Nicaragua and that's where it all started. So he's involved in shipping and cattle and pork, uh, obviously tobacco. So, uh, he's got his hands pretty busy in a lot of different functions every day. Yeah, so, so, but he, so that, I don't know if you recall, but I don't, cause I don't know, but he came later to the game of tobacco. Is that correct? He did. He did. Um, he did. Uh, so, I mean, he's been there for quite a while. Um, however, um, the uh, he is, as a businessman, he's very smart. So I mentioned earlier when he went to Cuba to buy the Carajo 99 seed, uh, he pretty much, in a nutshell, I can imagine this is how it went. So, okay, I want to hire you. 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 You're coming to Nicaragua with me. <laughs> and that's how it happened. Nice. So, nice. um uh, and so, and, and I, I, you know, being military, uh, as a veteran, 
I'm very passionate about uh, finding people's strengths and uh, working together on different people's strengths. And uh, as a businessman uh, and as a, you know, tobacco, tobacconist, uh, that's what exactly what he did. He, he, he found people's strengths and he capitalized on it and uh, utilized it to, to uh, make the company what it is today. So is it who now that now that say Ramos has passed away, who's taking his, his position there? Do you know? I don't know the answer to that. Okay. I will find out. Uh, that has been asked before, and uh, I honestly forgot all about it. So I will. I'll, I'll ask again. <laughs> right on, right on. So here's what's huh? when you were at the factory. Like if you see the picture now huh? with Dion here, where he's right. Right. One thing that I really thought was really interesting about this particular space was you only have two little fans in the corner of the room, mm-hmm. but the ability for that room to clear itself of smoke was so impressive. I don't know if you had the chance to smoke in there, but it was like... Was I, I, I noticed that when I was there. Yeah, I noticed that. I don't know if it's just a natural, the weather, the way it is. I honestly did not notice anything fancy in the ceilings like you would see in a typical cigar lounge. Um, I, I didn't notice anything, I, and I'm sure you didn't as well. Um, so, um, you know, these guys do this every single day. So um, I, maybe the building's situated a certain way where it's as easy as it blows out. I have no idea. But I did definitely notice that. Yeah. Because uh, we. There's actually just two small fans like, next yeah. to each other. Mm-hmm. In the All right. And I was like, Mm-hmm. How is that possible? Right. Yeah, better than most lounges I've been to. So. Yeah, yeah, I noticed that too. <laughs> yeah, yeah, beautiful, beautiful. So this cigar is smoking really, really well. I mean, really. Mm-hmm. Well. I was a hundred percent confident you would say that. Between the oils of the wrapper, I mean, it's just a sexy cigar. I mean, there's just no, uh, I mean, uh, I, you know, I, uh, I do, I tell people all the time, listen, uh, I don't just say this because I work for Agonorsa, you know, uh, I, I still work for the same wholesale and distributor that I did for the past three years. So say that I actually have the opportunity to smoke anything I want. You know, I can get it from my boss, anything. Um, and he owns a lounge as well. I don't smoke anything but Agonorsa. Oh, beautiful. Um, That's a great. There's a lot to choose from within there. Yeah. So, and I mean, the only, I do exceptions. Uh, for example, uh, I will do a, uh, a nice plug for my buddy Dave here. Uh, I just like to real quick just kind of show the, the lounge here. Fantastic. Yeah. Uh, Dave, say hello. This is Dave Putsvik, the owner. Oh, yeah. So, How's it going? they say hello. Um, so I will say, if you're ever in the uh, Pittsburgh area, uh, like I say, I don't only smoke Aganorsa, but however, when someone has something unique they made, um, I will say that he does have uh, four different blends of his own Leaning House uh, cigar. So he does have a Habano, a Connecticut, a Maduro, and a Connecticut Broadleaf. And I got to tell you, uh, they they are phenomenal. So Leaning House cigars, uh, call here anytime. I'm Dave will ship them to you. So it's a great guy. Yep. And, and, and yes, they definitely are. So uh, I, I will say if anybody's ever, again, if you're up in Pittsburgh, if you plan on coming up anywhere near me, please, by all means, reach out to me. Uh, and I will definitely tell you, you know, give you the ins and outs everywhere you go. You be, I mean, you could, I, I, if I wasn't doing this, I'd be getting tour buses and bringing people to Pittsburgh and doing cigar tours. <laughs> So, so what is it that separates this to the Pittsburgh scene from other places in the country? I don't know. Um, so, I'm originally from Texas. I left Texas when I was 19, uh, and I got I got stationed in an even hotter place. I was in Charleston, South Carolina. Uh, so, I didn't get to tour. I, I I was I've been on the East Coast pretty much my entire life. Um, so, when I worked for like I mentioned before, I worked part time for cigar lounges. Even in the South, uh, it was super competitive with a guy that was 10, 12 miles down the road. 
super competitive. I mean, you weren't even allowed to mention their name in the shop, you know. Um, and, and as a cigar broker, I, 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 tr- I travel everywhere, up and down East Coast and the Atlantic especially. And uh, I mean, for the most part, there is a lot of support between shops. Everybody knows each other and stuff. But Pittsburgh has a very unique uh, magic about it. Like, for example, when there's a shop across town that has an event, the other shops will promote it. Oh, and hell, they'll, they'll shut down and go to it. Wow. So um, that uh, a good example is uh, Rocky Patel. They have a burn lounge here. That's real fancy and, you know, nice bar and everything. When he did his grand opening, every cigar shop owner in Pittsburgh was there for the grand opening. And so uh, that's what's magical about it. It's just uh, when you sit in one shop, you feel like you're sitting in all of them. So oh, it's, you got to try it. So what part of what part of town is is this lounge? In? Is Dave's lounge? In? So uh, Leading House is probably the first lounge you'll hit coming into Pittsburgh. What are you about thirty miles, twenty miles south? Yeah, twenty miles south of Pittsburgh. It's in a small little town called Bell Vernon, right on the water. Uh, it's called Leaning House because it's actually an old house. It kind of leans a little bit. So uh, it's pretty cool. Look it up on Facebook. You'll see it. It's, it's a really cool image. So, uh, yeah. And then uh, it's a great place to start or finish a little Pittsburgh tour. And then you go into the city and then you'll start mapping out and you can see different lounges to stop at. And everybody's going to be very hospitable to you. So. All right. All right. So you said it was um, Bell Vernon. Is that correct? Yeah, Bell Vernon, B E L L E, Vernon, V E R N O N. Yep, there it is. There we are. There we are. There it is. Yep, that's him. That's the shop. So, yeah. And uh, I mean, if you're ever in Western Maryland, it's just a really short uh, drive here. Uh, so I was surprised one time. I uh, I wasn't doing Pittsburgh uh, route that that week, uh, but I happened to be in Gaithersburg, Maryland. I was heading west. And I thought, well, what the hell? Why not? And so I was surprised how quickly I was at Dave's shop. So it uh, wasn't bad at all. It wasn't as far as I, I thought it was going to be. Yeah, not too far from 70, right off of 70. No, yeah, right off of 70. Oh, Morgantown's only a little ways away. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. Great. Yeah, great place to vacation, that's for sure. Now, how far do you have? Oh, yeah, Seven Springs is where? Oh, yeah. So you're yep. supposed to go to Seven Springs in the summer. So definitely. Oh, right perfect. Off. I actually did an Agonorsa event with Terrence in Seven Springs last year. So, oh, really? yeah, we, yeah, they had a country club. It was, uh, uh, I think it was a skeet shooting range or something. It was a bluff that was looking over all the mountains. And uh, we had, uh, what's your friend's name? Uh, Not Anthony, is it? No, Eric Lenhart. Oh, I probably saw him there. Oh, yeah, he's from Baltimore, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he, yeah, I met him. We yeah, go, We go shooting there with him. Yeah. 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 I met him. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, good. Good. Yeah. Yeah. You're, you're thinking about Tony just, Masato, right? Yeah. So just tell him the guy in the funny hat, you know? So, yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm never without my hat. As soon as I started wearing these hats, people don't recognize me without them now. <laughs> so, what brought the hat about? Uh, so I, uh, I did, I, I mentioned I worked Russian helicopters in the, in the Air Force. Yes. I was actually uh, an advisor to the Afghan Air Force for an entire year. So I lived on the Afghan base for a whole year. Wow. So when you do a year tour with any branch, pretty much, uh, you have the option to take a two-week R&R, and they'll fly you anywhere in the world you want to go. Since my passport wasn't updated, <laughs> I uh, was limited to the U.S., so I picked uh, Venice Beach, California. And I rented a little beach bungalow for two weeks, just listen to the waves and chill and I mean, literally, my first day, I was still my combat boots on. I walked into a beach shop and bought shorts and everything and put all, all my military uniform in a big old beach bag <laughs> and walked to my rental. Um, so as I was walking down in Venice Beach, there's a hat shop there called Titanic Hats. And uh, there's a guy in there, a little short guy. Well, he's not short. Same, same size. Uh, so uh, they call him Carl the Hat Doctor. And so this is where Brad Pitt and all of your famous people buy their hats from in L.A. And, uh, well, according to Carl the Hat Doctor, but they had pictures of them on the wall. So 
Uh, so Carl must have come up to me and put probably about almost a hundred hats on my head until he said, all right, that's it right there. And it was a fedora, my first ever. Now, granted, I'm wearing shorts, but I, I, I just grew into it. And, uh, uh, I brought it back to Afghanistan with me. I had no choice. Um, uh, so I would sit out outside it in the evening time with my hat on and, you know, smoking cigars in Afghanistan. And, uh, but, uh, ever since then, it just be kind of became part of me. I'm a big collector now. I probably have about 20 hats from different places around the world. So, uh, yeah. So my, my favorite company is a company called Gorin brothers. Uh, unfortunately the one that was in DC, uh, it burned down. So the closest one to you guys would be in Brooklyn. Uh, but, uh, Gorin, they, they, they hand make hats and, uh, and the one I'm wearing now is actually my all time favorite right here. Um, with the weather changing, I got to go to my lighter hats. I'm, that's unfortunate because I love my winter hats. So, yeah, Gorn Brothers. Yeah, they got fast name. Um, Where are they made? You know, uh, I think in PA. I think I got to look it up. I'm not real sure. Uh, I will tell you this. Uh, I, my wife and I love to go to New Orleans, and. Uh, in New Orleans, they have two Gorham Brothers stores, and the second one, outside of Bourbon Street, uh, actually has an entire room of nothing but uh, discounted hats, 50 to 75% off from last year's collection. And uh, so that's a great place. They don't ship them. you got to be there in person to buy them. So uh, every couple of years, we'll go in there and stock up. Excellent. Actually, I have to go there for a coffee convention in September. So I'll we'll, tell you where to go. I yep. will definitely be in touch with you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> fantastic, fantastic. Oh, they, they even have Panama hats. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, very high quality hats. These are the hats that you're going to pass down to your grandchildren. So they're not something, you know, I, I used to buy cheap hats because I would see something at a flea market and say, oh, let me wear that. I got rid of all of them. These things last, I mean, just like Aganor said, with professionalism and quality. You know, this is quality. So, so getting into quality hats, like obviously that's going to cost more oh. than like the cheap hats. What kind of price range are you? Do you have to get into? You're looking at around uh, between a hundred to seven hundred dollars. Okay. So I don't go to seven hundred. Uh, I can't afford that. I probably could, but it wouldn't be wise. Um, so I have I average about a hundred hundred fifty dollars for a hat. You know, and I don't buy them often, so it's a good treat. Maybe a couple a year. You know, so then I have them all lined up in my office. My wife, actually, I got her on the hats, too. So she'll wear her her hats, too, as well. So she's got a nice little collection. Yeah. So do you have to get them blocked? Is that right? Reblocked again? Is that correct? Or yeah. So uh, the good thing about Gorham Brothers, you can go to any Gorham Brothers store and uh, they'll, they'll clean it. They'll resize it. They'll do everything. They'll fix it. It's got a lifetime we guarantee you on. So that's a great, great thing. I. Uh, I actually have I have the whole setup at my house. I have the steamer and I have everything. So, yeah. Uh, you can do it all yourself then. Yeah. Excellent. Excellent. Oh yeah, definitely. Let me know. And that goes for anybody else out there too. I I, I am on social media. Um, there's a million Mike Kings out there, so just put my name in there, Michael King. Uh, and I I'm pr probably I'll be mutual friends with somebody you know in the cigar industry. That's the easiest way to find me. Because uh, Mike King is a very common name. Um, on Instagram, uh, michael.king1092, 1092. Um, uh, but uh, I, I say this because uh, social media wise, Agonorsa Leaf, we have a uh, wonderful, wonderful social media presence now. Uh, go to Facebook and look for Agonorsa Acolytes. Um, Agonorsa Acolytes is a closed group, but uh, all you got to do is press the little button to join, and we'll definitely add you in. Um, and on the Agonorsa Acolytes page, you will see people uh, smoking and featuring uh, an old taps of something that they had 10 years ago to the latest and greatest from uh, Rainier Lorenzo with HBC. Anything that's Agonorsa associated at all, uh, some... Uh, just a couple of days ago, uh, I don't know if you know Kevin Schweitzer, who owns Rockefeller Cigar Company. He just did a collaboration with, yeah, uh, he did a collaboration with Agonorsa recently, um, and uh, it was a fundraiser. Uh, he made, I, uh, Kevin, don't kill me if you're watching this. I, it was called Magical Hat or Magic Hat or something like that. 
But anyway, it was a great cigar, and somebody was smoking it on, uh, uh, you know, on our social media page, and I thought that was kind of cool. And put the Agon and made it. So oh, very cool, very cool. You bet. Oh, thank you for doing it. That's great. Absolutely. Absolutely. We got yours here up here as well. The, uh, mm -hmm. Perfect. Mm -hmm. Yeah, excellent, excellent. Yeah, and, this yeah, and if uh, really beautiful. I mean, it's it's nice. It's kind yeah. of full bodied. Not mm -hmm. as heavy though. But it's got nice. No. Uh, Notes of yeah. and like espresso yeah. really Yes. Cool. Um, you know, uh, we didn't talk too much about coffee on my part. People ask me all the time, uh, what do you pair a cigar with? I mean, quite, the real, the honest answer is whatever you got in your hand. I mean, whatever, whatever fits best for you, really. Um, however, from my personal preference, uh, black coffee. Um, and, uh, of course, I'm, I'm going to try exactly what you just did earlier to start the day on this. Um, I'm fascinated with coffee. I'm, I'm not as good as it as you are. Uh, but uh, I do have a little hand grinder, conical grinder that I bring with me on the road. And I'll grind my beans with it. And I have a press that I bring on the road with me. I have a handheld uh, espresso maker that I use. Uh, um, I can't remember the name right now. It's in a, It's like a barrel shape. You put the hot water on the bottom and you pack it and use this the same technology as a really expensive espresso machine, but you hand pump it and you bring the pressure. And then as you hand pump it, it goes into the cup and makes a perfect crema. So, so I have a, like a, on the road, I'll, I'll pull over and I'll have like a, I usually have like a, a thermos of hot water and I'll just pull over and make me an espresso. So, but uh, I love Coffee along with a good cigar is uh, priceless to me. So, so you have a favorite coffee? Uh, yes, actually, I do. Recently, uh, past couple of years, I uh, there is a coffee company in New Orleans. It's called Try Me Coffee. That's it. Try Me Coffee. Um, uh, I was at a, a little dive bar, twenty four hours a day, uh, in New Orleans called uh, Bufa's uh, Restaurant. And they served me coffee, and I said, this coffee is phenomenal. What am I drinking? And the guy said, ah, oh, it's a local, local place. Try me. So I actually ordered my coffee from them. Um, yeah, that's great coffee. I, I, I couldn't tell you what the blend is. I couldn't tell you how they do it. I don't know where they source the beans from. I have no idea. All I know is I really like it, and I really like how the coffee pairs well with my cigars. All right. All right. Yeah, I see, I see their, their website here. Well, oh yeah excellent and uh you can only order it online so you they don't even have a pocket retail space oh really so yeah a friend of mine in new orleans went to go get me some coffee and they said you have to actually order it so uh, uh i try to get there about once a year uh, obviously because of covid uh you know, we haven't been there two years, and uh, this year we probably won't go either. My wife just got her passport updated, so uh, chances are, come um, uh, you know, in winter time for cigar industry, it's a perfect time for us to go on vacation. So, uh, so usually after Christmas, my wife and I will go somewhere. Uh, so we're uh, probably going to go somewhere tropical this year. <laughs> so, um, I've never been to Belize. So uh, I served in the Air Force with a guy named Johnny Grief, uh, and he actually owns the airline Tropic Air down there. Uh, his grandfather had it before him, his father before that, you know. So uh, they uh, groomed me. He's been down there for about six years now. So I'd like to see him and smoke some scars with him and just hang out. It's a beautiful place from what I hear. I know a lot of people have visited there. And uh, I'll probably bring my own cigars. I heard the cigar shops aren't too great down there, so. So was he a pilot in the Air Force as well? Or? No, it was just like me. I, I, I uh, he was a, I believe Johnny was a, uh, what we call a crew chief. He was a general mechanic. Uh, my job was the avionics system. So I, I worked on the navigations and the communication systems. So uh, I met Johnny actually, even though we were stationed at the same base, I actually met him in the Middle East uh, because we have a special team that flies with the pilots as crew chiefs, mechanics. So, if, uh, you know, when the pilots land in really obscure places, they need a mechanic on board in case anything goes wrong at all. And so it's a very, very select team of individuals that do this. And Johnny was one of them. 
So they were passing through where I was stationed at, and he and I were smoking cigars together and just chatting, more shit, and you know, and then I found out he was from uh, Belize, and you know, so we stayed in touch ever since then. Oh, nice, nice. Mm-hmm. So you were in Afghanistan for a year. Yeah. That? Oh, yeah. Um, my dad thinks they did a Manchurian candidate on me because I actually loved it. Um, uh, now I, it wasn't all, you know, rosy. I, I lost some very, very close friends of mine. Um, so, and then of course we got attacked quite often. It's just a normal thing. However, I will say this, the Afghans are some of the most, the nicest and gentlest people I've ever met in my life. Uh, I still stay in touch with quite a few of them. I couldn't get a security clearance today to save my life. <laughs> so, um, but uh, I was in Western Afghanistan. I was about uh, probably about 60 miles from Iran. And uh, I, I've never seen more beautiful sunsets and sunrises in my life. It was absolutely stunningly beautiful. And then being, uh, being able to fly with Afghans, you flew in places the Americans normally don't fly. So you got to fly over some valleys where some like there's some beautiful like uh, springs and stuff. Um, you know, find different places and stuff. I took quite a few pictures uh, from the from the helicopter. So, um, yeah, it was, it was. I mean, I'd go back tomorrow if I didn't think that I'd be killed. <laughs> so, oh, yeah. unfortunately, that's, yeah. that's a difficult reality there. I I have a good story about that though. Uh, so I was in Korea for two years, mm-hmm. and uh, so uh, there was a squadron on base that sponsored some Korean war vets to come to Korea to the base. And it was the first time coming back to Korea since the Korean War. So the last time they were in Korea was nothing but carnage. So to see these older gentlemen's eyes and teared up crying by seeing the elementary schools and seeing kids playing in the street and seeing businesses and seeing all that, that was a beautiful sight to me. So I used to tell my Afghans that story and I said, listen, you know, I, I hope and pray that in 20, 30, 40, 50 years, you know, if I lived that long, uh, I'd like to come back and see the same thing. So, yeah. yeah. Western Afghanistan, is, that, is, that, is Kabul in Western Afghanistan? Kabul is in Eastern. Eastern. Yeah, so Kandahar is in Western Afghanistan. Okay. Are the cultures very different on the different parts of the country? Um, slightly. Uh, so the language that's predominantly spoken there is called Dari. Uh, very similar to uh, uh, the Iranian language, I think, Farsi. Uh, and then the other language is called uh, uh, Pashtu, which I heard is similar to Urdu. Uh, so uh, where I, the territory I was at, most people spoke Dari. Um, so when you, you're on the eastern side, there's a lot of uh, very blended Pakistani, Afghani culture. So, and then on my side, obviously, there was a lot of uh, a combination of uh, Persian culture with Iran, Afghanistan. And then we also had, uh, for where the territory I was at, it was a, uh, kind of like a Mongolian influence of Afghans. They, they looked, uh, um, they, they, uh, you would never thought, you know, I'm in Af- Afghanistan, but uh, their ancestors were from Mongolia. So there's a whole, you know, uh, yeah, so it was a, it was it was a really interesting uh, clash of cultures, and then if anybody, uh, if you look at the history of Afghanistan, it's been a critical place for thousands of years. For uh, so, I mean, you can imagine how many cultures blended. Uh, you know, I, I worked with some of some Afghan uh, mechanics. One guy had red hair. Well, the Russians were occup- Russians occupied Afghanistan for a while, so apparently he had a father that was a Russian. So. Uh, I worked with uh, an older Afghan gentleman, uh, uh, Abdul Jabbar, believe it or not, was his name. Um, he was the uh, the commander, and I was in a place called, uh, uh, I don't know why I can't think of the name of it. But anyway, uh, he actually had two families. He had a wife and kids up in Russia and uh, in Kiev, and uh, he had a wife and family in Afghanistan. And it surprises you because you see these guys, you know, uh, I, I learned more from them than they learned from me. I mean, these gentlemen that I worked with had one or two master's degrees in engineering from Kiev and Moscow. So just because they were out there farming on the farms and fields doesn't mean that they didn't have the smarts. <laughs> so, yeah, and they, I mean, the stories that they told were just absolutely fascinating. 
fascinating stories. So. Part of the reason I'm asking about like the difference between like Cabo and Sydney. Mm-hmm. When next time you come to Baltimore, if you're interested, there's a family from Cabo that has opened a small little cafe. So they're sort of like no kidding. Their traditional like. Yeah, I'd love food. that. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. Actually, it's actually in the ne- it's actually in the neighborhood where I have my coffee shop at a place called Hamden. Which oh, is nice. Too far from where Tony has his store. Nice. So it's pretty close, and we'll have to yeah. check it out. Yeah. Hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, you have to send me that link, and I'd love to come to your coffee shop. I would love, so, to, have you. love to have you. Uh, I'll be in uh, Baltimore in a couple weeks, as a matter of fact. All right, so, excellent. excellent. Yeah. So, when, so another thing I was wanting to see, since you were in Afghanistan, and you said you did you go to other parts of the Middle East as well? or? Uh, yeah, I travel quite extensively. Um, so my first trip to uh, the Middle East was uh, uh, a country called Oman, which is on the southern tip of uh, Saudi Arabia. Yes. Um, what a beautiful country. I was in a place called Thumbrate, which is on the Upper Peninsula. Um, so I was there right after September 11th. So very confusing time for everybody. Uh, and that was my first exposure to uh, Middle Eastern culture. And so there was no time to learn culture and language and all that stuff. Uh, we just got dropped in it. And dropped in the middle of Ramadan. They didn't even know what Ramadan was at the time. Oh, wow. So... Um, but, uh, and then, uh, I flew through Kuwait a few times. Uh, but my main place I was, uh, stationed was, uh, some, uh, some people call it Qatar or Qatar, however you want to say it. Oh, yes, uh, yes. that's the largest operation there out there, out there in the Middle East. So we, we, uh, worked out there and that was pretty, I mean, it was really depressing on the base, but the, the city of, of uh, Doha was about 20 miles away. So you got a pass from going to the city and it was just a really fascinating city. Not not too different from from what I hear. I've never been to Dubai, but very similar to Dubai. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, Dubai, Dubai is really an interesting. I've been there a couple of times, and it's really an interesting country to go to. Yeah, I actually uh, talk about coffee again. Mm-hmm. I uh, I became good friends with in in the mall and uh, and Doha. There was a coffee stand there, and these two gentlemen that were there, they were actually Qatari, young, very young. They were like. Uh, I don't know, royalty somehow. Um, and uh, I got to know them pretty well. And they were very, very particular on how they made their coffee. Very similar, not exactly what you did earlier, but a uh, similar kind of like care and everything on how they made the coffee. And it was it was delicious. And so uh, I got uh, to be very close friends with them uh, every time. That was my first stop every time I went into the city. And uh, and and uh, trips after that, as a matter of fact, every time I went in there, uh, I was in... Uh, I was stationed there four times in a row, so I used to go see them often. So, so were they were they doing Western style coffee, or were they doing more of the Arabic style? Coffee? No, it was Western style. Western style. It was Western style. Yeah, yeah. yeah, that's the Western style coffee has really exploded through the Middle East mm-hmm. over the last yeah. couple of years. So, yeah. it's really amazing. Like uh, we do, I do some work with uh, some groups in uh, Riyadh, Saudi Arabia. Yeah. And it's just amazing how, mm-hmm. how deep they're really into it now. So are Nicaraguan cigars now out there. Um, uh, so are Nicaraguan cigars. Oh, are they really? So, yes. Uh, so it's not uncommon now to go into the Middle East and to uh, certain uh, uh, kiosks in the malls or certain uh, hotels and see uh, uh, everything from acids to Patrons to Fuentes to Dominicans. Uh, I was very surprised to see that. Yeah, so, that yeah, great. yeah. Does Aganorsa have much representation in that part of the world? Yeah. I don't know. I would like to find out because that would be a nice next chapter for me if I was the case. Yeah, not be, be, maybe you get stationed out or positioned out there. Yeah, or I love. I, 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 I have an eternal travel lust, so I would love to do that. Mm-hmm. Um, have you been able to travel much in the world, or? Uh, no, not since I retired. Okay. Uh, so you know, uh, military. Obviously, I, I, I explored. Uh, I. I kind of got lost on purpose, uh, so uh, you know everything. I went to Paris four times. First time was with a bunch of GIs. Uh, they were very embarrassing. <laughs> so uh, the next three times was just by myself, and I had a lot more fun. And uh, so uh, in Korea, I was a member of the Opera House in Seoul, Korea. I was the only American there. And uh, so I explored around. I, I every weekend, every time off I had, I did something different. Um, 
you know, Guam was uh, fascinating. I was there for a month in Guam. That was beautiful. Um, was so, yeah, I liked it a lot. It was quiet. It was, uh, they call it the poor man's Hawaii. Mm-hmm. So, um, yeah, there's a lot of Japanese tourists that come through there. They got two big bases there. They got an Air Force base and a Navy base. So, for such a small island, there's a very large military presence. And that's also American territory. Yes, so, yes. Um, but I mean, you could circle the whole island, you know, in a few hours. But, you know, yeah, it's just really nice. And, uh, well, you know, I, I dated this back in college. I dated a girl from Benedict. Oh, no kidding. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. Really, really. Yeah. I, I, didn't, I didn't get to go visit her there, but she yeah. used to live in Honolulu. So, oh, nice. Yeah. yeah. That's where I got to go. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I, I've only been to the airport in Guam. Yeah. So yeah, I'd like to go back. Place. One of the advantages of being retired military is uh, uh, we can actually travel to a military air force base or even Army Air Force if they have, uh, 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 even the Navy. If, if, if they have a flight going anywhere in the world and they have uh, space, you can uh, fly, you can just jump on as a retiree, space available, and go. Now, is it true in the, in, as a retiree with the military like that? Now, is it, the availability is also based on rank? Is that true? Uh, yeah. So, obviously, being a retiree, uh, retirees are the very lowest <laughs> priority to fly. Um, so your active duty members, uh, especially on leave or emergency or whatever, uh, they would be a higher uh, priority and the highest priority, obviously, are the people that are actually on the mission. And um, so I have not experienced it yet. Um, um, I have been told that when you, as you're retired, rank does not matter. Uh, but and I haven't heard anything about that yet. But I, I have a suspicion that it. If I'm in line, I've retired as a master sergeant. If I'm in line, there's a general, retired general in front of me. I got a feeling he's probably going to get better treatment than me. <laughs> I bet, I bet, my goodness. Mm-hmm. So you, you were in Paris four times. Do you have a, how is the cigar scene in Paris? Uh, there, it, well, when I was there, it was, I mean, that was many years ago. Uh, it was just Cuban cigars. So, uh, and, this was before they banned smoking all over Paris. Uh, oh, okay. I I would just uh, go buy my uh, my Monte Cristo number no. two and sit in a cafe. Oh, I think we we lost you there. Yeah, yeah. So I uh, but I really enjoyed it. People watching that was just a passion of mine. So uh, so I don't know. I haven't been there. quite a while. I've been retired for seven years. So. Okay. Oh, nice. Nice. Yeah, Paris is a beautiful city. Beautiful city to visit. Uh-oh, I think we're losing signal from Mike. Yeah, but if you ever go to Paris, Paris is a wonderful little city. I I personally haven't been there. It's, oh, my gosh. It must be pushing ten years. But there's this one little cafe in the sixth. It's a I think it's called a Cuban cafe, and it's got jazz music inside, and you can sit outside and smoke. It's really a wonderful, wonderful spot in Paris. So if you ever get to Paris, that's a great place to go. So we're smoking the the Aganorsa Rare Leaf Reserva. And um, it's been a great cigar. A lot of notes of cacao and coffee, as well as some nice red pepper notes, a little bit of leather, and then there's a little bit of a, a lemon zesty citrusiness to it. That's been really pleasant. But it is, it is more on the fuller, heavier kind of smoke. So definitely, it's it's really, 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 really nice. So let's look at some of the things here. So Half Wheel offered up some some reviews here and so these are from March of 2021 and let me see if I can pull it here for you so you can see it all let me add that on here so if you're watching this on the restream this is the Agonosa Rare Leaf Reserve and it's uh, just been smoking wonderfully oh Mike you're back excellent yeah yeah all right excellent <laughs> 
reset the internet here. Yeah. What's that? I, I can hear you the whole time, but uh, I had to get a stronger connection here. So. Uh, no uh, yeah, and I just heard you say uh, you're reading on Half Wheel about the uh, the reviews. Yeah, yeah, they were talking about the. Uh, mm-hmm. Let's just pull that up here so that we can see it. Um... So Half Wheel gives it an 89. Mm-hmm. And, um, which I thought was kind of interesting. They, 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 they talked about um, that a fairly pedestrian first third, but handsomely rewarded if you stick with it. I, I think it's. I don't have any of that. That lowness in the first third of the experience. I didn't either. I uh, I didn't either. I mean, I I I, uh, I would say, uh, you know, I, I read all the reviews because I want to see what's going on with the product and what people are thinking. Uh, but uh, and it's very important as far as uh, retailers and also brokers and reps on the road to have reviews from uh, people like Half Wheel, uh, Cigar Coop, who is uh, you know one of my favorites to listen to. Boston Jimmy's another one. Uh, but Half Wheel, uh, I mean, they, uh, you know, with their publications, I mean, they're probably one of the best known to uh, uh, pay attention to. I say that, though, uh, does not mean I always agree <laughs> uh, with reviews <laughs> that I see. Um, That's something we talk about a lot on this show is about the, the, the way people score and how it goes. Yeah. So one of the things that, because I do a lot of uh, judging of competitions in coffee. Right. So we, we really press our judges to to not just give a score, but also have the score match their descriptions, you know, so that yeah. if they're, sitting, they're talking in a certain way, it should reflect the score. And, you know, like, so, and I would say that these were interesting because, like, I'm looking right now at the, um, the one from, from uh, Cigar Authority, and they gave it a mm-hmm. 93, and then Stogie, yep. Stogie Press gave it a 92. Stogie Press. But, uh-huh. The interesting thing that I thought with, between these three was that they had a lot of shared notes and flavor notes. So mm-hmm. I think that, you know, it, it's nice to see that, I think maybe, I would think that for this, in my experience, for this experience, I think I would really think that it's a little bit low on the, on the scale for half of but I think that the other two, um, Cigar Authority and Cigar and Stogie, oh. Stogie Press is pretty much on the money with that. Yeah, I uh, I think you made a good point there. Um, uh, that's exactly what I look for when I'm looking at multiple reviews. Is I'm looking to see consistency in the description, not consistency in the rating. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Uh, yeah, this is really nice. How's your cigar turning out? Ah, oh, great, great. Uh, I would say my palate's shot, but it's not. This is probably my fifth one today. So. <laughs> Uh, um, I, uh, I, you know, I, I haven't had a rare leaf in, in a week. I probably, Dave has them here. So he's one of our select retailers here in Pittsburgh. Okay. So I'll probably pick up a few, uh, before I leave the shop here. So for the, in, in like city like Pittsburgh, where there's such a large competition of, of cigar shops that are, that are mm-hmm. you know, in tandem, is there only one select for Agnorsa? There are three select uh, Aganorsa retailers in Pittsburgh. So uh, the one I just mentioned here at Leaning House. Uh, the second would be would be a store called Old Allegheny, uh, and that's uh, Old Allegheny Smoke. It's uh, uh, Steve Borock is the owner. They're a select retailer, and then there's another uh, store called uh, uh, Mark Holbein, who has Superior Cigar Smokes, uh, two locations, but it's Natrona Heights location. So uh, I kind of purposely uh, uh, wanted that to happen with just three. I was hoping not to have more because uh, uh, I didn't want to saturate the market. It just makes those shops a little bit more, you know, approachable. It gives them a little bit more attention. And, uh, and I mean, I have nine retailers in Pittsburgh that do carry Agonorsa products now, so and they do all get along. So if somebody goes and asks for rare leaf, they'll just they'll say, "Hey, one well, the nearest place is Leaning House or Old Allegheny or whatever." So I see. So is, mm-hmm. it, is that to say that it's up to you to decide which retailer? Oh no, no. Anybody that calls me wants to order, that's their decision. Mm-hmm. So uh, at, the main reason I do that is uh, see the the three that I mentioned uh, have been supporting our product for quite a while. So. Um, if so, I, I did get quite a few calls that say they wanted to be a select retailer, okay. 
I, uh, I kind of talked him out of it uh, because uh, I, I really don't want to have a retailer. And Terrence Riley is the one that kind of pushed this to me, and I agree with him. Uh, we want to build you up to be that account. We want to be a support. I don't want to sell you a one-time package, and then I, you don't call me again for six, seven, eight months. You know, I don't want you sitting on a lot of product. I want you to be able to have that support that I've already built up with you already. And that way, when it's time for you, when you want to be a select retailer, uh, it's absolutely nothing. It's easy flow for you to sell anything and everything that's in your shop because it's already been going on for a while. If you've never carried our product before and now you have rare leaf, I don't want people to come to your store just to buy the rare leaf. You know, we have, although it's a great cigar, you know, we have quite a uh, lineup of cigars for you to try. And I'd rather uh, build up shops with our core product, our core line with our Lunatics, our JFR, our Agonorsa series. Um, and, uh, and then Rare Leaf is kind of like a, a bonus on top of that. I see. I see. So is it, for your, for your distribution with Agonorsa, is it, it's just limited to those three, JFR, Lunatic, and the Agonorsa Leaf brands, or are there other... No, so our, our entire lineup, uh, Agonorsa, so we distribute, uh, so uh, as a retailer, a retailer can buy from me, they can buy uh, the Agonorsa Leaf Series, which is Habano, Corojo, Maduro, and Connecticut, uh, the JFR Series, the Lunatic Series, which is in three categories, the Loco Series, which are short figurados, the Torch Lunatic, which have a small shag foot on them, and then the Standard Lunatic, which uh, everything from the 8x80 to the short uh, Robusto. Um, and then you have the Guardian of the Farm that uh, you can order from me as well. The Guardian of the Farm and the Guardian of the Farm we call it Night Watch, which was uh, released two years ago with our Maduro. It's actually a Corojo 99 Shade Grown Maduro. So um, it's a very unique Maduro, uh, different. It kind of takes the bite away from the Corojo and smooths it out quite a bit. Um, so, and then we have our anniversary series, uh, which we still make. So, uh, our 2013, 14, and 2015, we still make uh, make those and distribute those. And then uh, then we have our uh, regular, what we call Casa Fernandez series, uh, which are the Casa Fernandez. We have uh, the Arsenio Oro, the Arsenio line, which Arsenio was our master blender for many years. He passed away a few years ago. So that was a blend that he made for himself. I'm sure you had it when you were down there. Um, so yeah, so, um, but, uh, you know, so I, I, um, so when I'm, when I'm supporting the event, my goal to every retail store, my goal is to give them the tools to sell the cigars uh, while I'm not there. So, uh, I, I don't want to be the guy that has, cause my events when I do tastings are very exciting, a lot of fun. Um, so you know, everybody's doing Fumas and I don't want to leave and next thing you know, nothing sells. I want to make sure that the retailer and his staff and, and the people in there uh, will have the tools. They have the information in their head. They have the FUMAs, everything, to be able to continue that, you know, passion. So I'm the kind of uh, rep that I would rather a retailer buy six boxes versus 50 boxes on an opening order because I want to have that relationship with you. I want to keep that going. So I'd rather hear from you every couple of weeks than once every six months because – you know, how am I going to be able to build a relationship with your clients and your customers and, you know, your staff if that's how we do it? Does yeah, that make any sense? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So going back to this Rarely Preserve, like, it's a, it's all a Nicaraguan co co cigar curl? Yes, it's 100% Nicaraguan. So the, the wrapper is, what, what's the wrapper then? You, you so that's that cafe wrapper. That's so, cafe wrapper. Okay. yeah. Uh -huh. So what makes the cafe wrapper the cafe wrapper? Uh, just the limited and uh, it's 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 a limit uh, from what what I've learned and from uh, Terrence has said uh, plenty of times it's just a smaller area of land where the tobacco is grown that's all so that's that's why it's called cafe nice. and then the the binder is both is two different Criollo 98s so yeah well uh, I say Criollo 98 dominant so uh, I uh, I couldn't tell you, not because I'm keeping it from you, but just simply I don't know okay. uh, the exact makeup of the Criollo versus the Corojo in it. But I can definitely tell you that the, the Criollo is much more dominant in there. 
So I, I can imagine that our Corojo is probably uh, Ristam Corojo in the filler, but I can imagine that the the binder plus the filler combined uh, would have some of that Criollo. So as you're probably tasting right now. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's, it's really, really a lovely cigar. Beautiful. Yeah. It's actually quite heavy yeah. now. It's getting yeah. heavier. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I say that a lot because uh, there's a there's a common misnomer that I used to do the same thing, so I'm just as guilty. Um, people used to come to retail stores, and the first thing they would like to say is, what's your strongest cigar? I want your strongest cigar. Well, what does that exactly mean? Um, so uh, just because it's a Maduro doesn't mean it's going to be strong. You know, right. now, and so what I do is I say, well, would you like our uh, our full flavor? I don't even say full body. I say full flavor you know, uh, with the most robust flavor. Um, so, uh, nothing that we make in Aganorsa, we don't have anything that's really full strength necessarily, but we sure do make a lot of full body. Would you, yeah. how would you rank them from like, I guess the most fullest body to the, the less full body? Uh, I would say majority of the Maduros would be a full bodied, uh, but they're not overwhelming. So our Maduros are very well balanced. Uh, probably the one that would probably be at the top of the full body would be our new Corojo 99 Shade Grown. Uh, so, uh, I, my opinion probably would differ than other people, but, uh, if I could rank them, I would probably say the, uh, uh, probably the, the wrapper that's on a Guardian of the Farm Nightwatch, the Maduro. It's also on a signature Maduro, same wrapper. And uh, it's also on our Lunatic Loco series. I would say that's probably the fullest that we have, because you're you're talking about Brojo, but instead of that that light peppery, you know, that you get, uh, you're getting a lot more of the uh, uh, fuller, uh, subtle sweetness combined with that Criollo. So it's really really heavy on the palate. And then I would say, as far as like. Me, I don't. I would describe a single cigar we make as uh, light bodied, or you know, I would. I would say that we start at the medium body. Uh, our uh, Agonorsa Connecticut's would probably be right at the medium body. Any of our Habano Ecuadorian Habano wrappers would probably be at the medium body. So, uh, yeah, that's kind of what I would. What would you say, Dave? The fullest body cigar we make. Yeah. I was thinking one of the new Maduros, you know, like the local series or the, yeah. You said local series, like crazy series or local? Yeah. So, uh, so I mentioned earlier that we have three different, uh, divisions of our lunatic series. So two years ago, we came out with the Lunatic Loco series. So uh, similar in shape to the uh, Flying Pig uh, that Drew Estate makes. Uh, so it's just really a short figurado. So what's different is uh, they're, they're tapered at both ends. And, but the difference is they're four and three quarter long. And they're 60. It's the smallest ring gauge that we make. 70 and 80. The short figurado tapered both ends. Those are unique, not just because of the size, but because it has that unique wrapper I just told you about, that Corolla 99 Shade Grown Maduro, and then you'll get that full bodiness of it. It's uh, If you haven't experienced it, uh, they are absolutely uh, amazing cigars. The price point, you're looking at right around $10 for retail, so it's worth a shot just to pick one up. Uh, so 10-count boxes. I would say most retailers at Terry Agonors have that in their shop now. I think he does. I, uh, I, I don't have his. Uh, you know, I'm caught, I'll be caught off guard. I don't have his list right now. I do have everything on file when he's ordered, uh, but I'm pretty confident he does. If, okay. if he doesn't, then uh, that's something I can talk to him about when I see him. <laughs> I'll have to check with him this weekend and see what he's doing. Yeah. So. Oh, my goodness. I will say about Raul. Um, Raul is not only a client, uh, I would call him a close friend. Okay. Uh, yeah, 
So uh, when I started in this industry, um, he uh, was one of my first visits. And uh, right off the bat, uh, he pulled me aside. I thought, oh, what did I do wrong? <laughs> you know? And he pulled me aside and complimented me. Oh. And, and so I, it, I really took it to heart because I just started in this industry. And so because of that, I mean, he and his father have been doing this for many, many years, his father before him. Um, so I, uh, I, I really value his opinion. And so as a personal friend and I would say a possible mentor, I, uh, when I have to make any decisions in this industry of where I want to go next or what I'm doing now, uh, Raul is one of three people that I call. Oh, fantastic. Yes. Yeah, so he is a very good guy. Yep. Yeah. Uh, so, and I, I, those that are watching this that have not been to the tobacco leaf, you know, with the new, um, uh, lounge, it's about a year old now, I guess. Um, you know, that's the old diner. Uh, I really like the way he's designed that, but, uh, if you ever have the opportunity to talk to his father and see his, uh, his love for his son and the family business and how they just work so well together, uh, it's, it's just a fascinating concept. Just, uh, you, you don't feel like you're in a business. You feel like you're in a family. So, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I remember his father, Harish, was, um, yes. I don't remember, I didn't know him when I was in high school, mm -hmm. but I do remember going to the mall where his father still was. Yes. Uh huh. And what we used to walk by, I mean, I've been in, yeah. in, in it many times. Over the yeah, years, sure. So. Yeah. Really yeah, they come quite a ways. Um, so. I'm, I'm, I'm very, very, very happy to partner with them. So, uh, uh, I mean, all, all, everybody I partner with, I'm excited about, but it just, uh, it's nice when you, uh, when you, when you partner with a retailer that will really, uh, pour out to you and be an open book to you about anything and everything you want to know or hear about. So, and that, that, that means a lot. The only thing he's got to work on is I still would like to get a, uh, Ruben sandwich there at the uh, at his uh, lounge but there's I, I haven't found the kitchen in that diner yet <laughs> uh, unfortunately they took that out yeah the, the, the <laughs> that in, they don't allow that unfortunately yeah, yeah I know <laughs> we're a little bit restricted here in Maryland mm -hmm. oh, yeah I will say this too uh, I, I found out uh, if you drive down the corner that gas station in the corner have you had the tacos from that place yes yes the R&R &R Taqueria very nice very nice oh oh my god Every single time, and every every time I'm with somebody that's you know with me, that's where I take them. No. Uh, yes, that's a good place. Have you, have oh you yeah. Turned you on to his cousin. His cousin owns a uh, a, a, a it's an Indian restaurant called um, Royal Taj. No, not yet. It's maybe about yeah. two miles from his shop, but it's mm -hmm. it's probably it's got to be the best Indian food in Maryland. Easy. Sounds fantastic. Yeah, yeah, really yeah. Stuff, yeah. Check it out next yeah. Yeah. I, uh, my boss is actually, uh, the one of my wholesaler boss is, uh, is Indian. So, oh. uh, and, and he and, uh, Raul are about the same age oh. and they have the same personality and stuff. So, uh, talking about one of three people that I call, you know, my boss, uh, he's not just my boss. He's a mentor of mine as well. I, I learn a lot from him. I watch him. So, I mean, uh, it's just uh, uh, he uh, forward thinking. He's four steps away ahead. And in my mind, is uh, everybody in this industry uh, always has something going on. So uh, and he also has a lounge in Philly. Is that correct? Yeah, we own the Smoker Zone in Philadelphia. What part of Philly? So, is uh, it's uh, North Central Philly. So uh, it's on Rising Sun Avenue in Philadelphia, and so a Smoker Zone. Okay. Is that nearby the? Um there's a Holtz out that way. Is, is that correct? Or is that uh, no, not as far as Holtz. Uh, our warehouse is not too far from Holtz. Okay. But uh, not as far. So we do get a lot of business from that because Holtz still has closer lounge. <laughs> okay. And then you said you're based in Delaware? I live in Delaware. My office is in Philadelphia. Oh, I see. So. Are you like closer to Wilmington? I guess that's everything's closer. Uh, so I, I, my wife works for the University of Delaware, so we actually live on the campus, the University of Delaware in Newark. So my wife's from, yeah, she's from Brooklyn, New York. She has never driven a car in her life. So, uh, 
So uh, when we move somewhere, we always strategically have to move somewhere close to her work. So, and it's perfect for me because I'm actually literally a, a mile from the interstate. Uh, I'm, I'm, I mean, if, if I couldn't pick a better place to be centralized for the entire mid Atlantic where I travel. I mean, with the exception of Pittsburgh, I could pretty much be home to all everywhere I go for dinner by seven. So, yeah, yeah. how far is your territory then? Um, Pittsburgh is pretty much uh, eastern PA, northeastern PA. Pittsburgh is about as far out as I go. Uh, I have the whole entire state of Pennsylvania and the entire state of uh, New Jersey. Um, so I, I've worked really hard on my route. I, I pretty much split my route into eight sections, so eight weeks. So um, I have what I call a local week, which I include Baltimore with. I have a lower Maryland, so around the D.C., you know, lower Maryland area. And I include usually lower Delaware along with that. So I tweak it every once in a while, but I try to stick with my plan. That's one of the hardest things as a rep, especially one that, uh, you know, your larger companies, they actually tell you where to go. They give you a list and everything. So I have had to create this for myself. And um, my boss does not, like, push me to do anything. He lets me create my own routes. And um, so with that being said, I have to maximize my time and maximize, uh, you know, the quality of the time I spend with people as well. Uh, so, uh, I very strategically laid out an eight week plan where I can definitely try to see. So I, it comes out to with, uh, everybody that is an Aganorsa, uh, current account, I could see them. I promise them I'll see them, uh, at least once every two months. Oh, great. Great. Mm-hmm. So when you're, let's say when you're out there in Pittsburgh this week, like how long will you stay out in Pittsburgh? Then? Uh, normally I rent an Airbnb when I'm up here. Um, I, uh, I'll, I'll uh, find a centralized location in the middle of Pittsburgh. I'll rent it for an entire week. And that way I can have like a base of operations. I do it for two reasons. One, I'm very passionate about the samples that I carry, uh, you know, especially during the wintertime. Um, so I like to have a place where I can keep uh, all my samples in a conditioned environment in a hotel or Airbnb or whatever. And that way I load up what I need, just what I need for the whole day and bring it with me and I bring it to every shop. Um, and then I, you know, and I also set up, I have an office set up, I set up in there so I can come back to my home office. So I have learned that the hard way over the, over the years. So it's a, it's, it's a hell of a, uh, a hall to be able to go from hotel to hotel every single night and load all that stuff in your room, you know? So, yeah. So and that, that but, would make you curious to know that, like, so for a rep like yourself, who's out there with your samples and, and your cigars, how do you store them? How do you transport with them? I use two coolers. Okay. Uh, so when I'm on my long trips, I use two coolers. I have what a, a giant igloo cooler. Um, and then I have uh, my products that I plan on using for events or whatever. I use them in, I have a Yeti cooler. And uh, I use just Bovita packs. And then I have some, uh, just some small, you know, handheld, uh, uh, you know, portable Zycar kind of uh, travel cases. And I use those for, you know, and that's what I load up th- through the day. Uh, you know, when I do events, uh, I'll bring the travel case and I'll just open it up on the counter. I'll have the Fumas in there. So if I'm working with somebody else, the guy at the counter can help somebody, you know, with the Fumas and stuff. So a little system. Every rep does something different, I imagine. Uh, uh, it's it's a nice network though. On the with all of us reps on the road, we all get along pretty well together. So it's a it's a tight uh, knit group. So uh, within territories and also across the U.S. as well, uh, we all know each other pretty well. So we can actually call each other and hey, do you know this guy? Give me some tidbits before I walk in. Can you give me an introduction? Uh, you know, and they'll they'll do the same thing for me. Or uh, hey, this this shop just opened up. Did you hear about it? You know that kind of thing. So that's an extremely critical part of this this business. So that's I wouldn't. I, oh, yeah, I, I would say I I I, uh, I wouldn't do. I would never. You know, they say you you know what your life's passion is. If you won the lottery today, what would you be doing tomorrow? Mm-hmm. I'd be doing the same exact thing tomorrow, just with a nicer car. <laughs> <laughs> fantastic, fantastic. So do you know? Yeah, what were you after? Are there a lot of new shops and cigar lounges opening? In your uh, I would say that. The biggest growth of opening shops is the Baltimore area for me. Really? Wow. 
Yes. Uh, I mean, it, uh, shops are popping up all the time in the Baltimore area. Um, I mean, it's, it's, it's a great business to be in. It's, uh, it's a hard business to be in, but it's a great business to be in. It's very lucrative if you do it right. Um, up here, not so much. I mean, you get uh, new shops that open up, uh, you know, occasionally. Uh, I track it, you know, it's uh, every waking moment I, I'm on social media. I'm on Google Maps. I'm looking, always looking at something, you know, that, and I'll add it to my list. Um, New Jersey, not as much. Uh, the taxes for cigars are 30% and New Jersey, so, uh, but they'll pop up. But I would say probably the area that I have seen grown the most with cigars is the Baltimore area. Any thoughts on why that is? Um, yeah, I, I, uh, the demographics in which I'm very grateful and I'm glad to see this, the demographics of the cigar industry, um, uh, has changed dramatically. So, um, you'll notice in Baltimore, there's a lot of African American owned lounges. Um, so, and I say that because 10 years ago, that was not the case at all. Um, so, uh, the times are changing and thank God they are. Um, and I think that's why, uh, these, these are opportunities that weren't there for, um, younger people of color that didn't have this opportunity 10 years ago. And, um, so, uh, they're encouraged by seeing other people doing the same thing and, um, they open up a lounge and I think it's fantastic. Okay. Now, is, so, like I've noticed that, I've definitely noticed that as well, this explosion in African-American. Yes. Is there a different approach that you that, that has taken for that market? Or um, or by, by cigar companies? I can't speak for others. Okay. Um, for myself, the military over twenty years has taught me a lot. I'm I'm a Southern white guy from South Texas. Okay. Uh, however, I'm married to a beautiful black woman from Tulsa. So. Um, I, uh, I'm always learning as a white guy, always. Uh, I, I never stop learning. I, I, I'm always empathetic. I'm always listening. To, and that's the key is, uh, I guess the biggest key would be to go in uh, with a humble heart and uh, to listen, always listen. Uh, and uh, I, uh, because number one, people can tell if you're full of shit. You know, and they, uh, you know, people, when you, when you go in there, they're going to see you checking your watch. They're going to know, they're going to look at your body language. They're going to know you're uncomfortable. Um, so I, I want a reason to be comfortable. I want to know what they're, I, I don't care. When I walk into a cigar shop, I don't care about the cigars at the point when I go in there. I'm a very soft salesman. Uh, I believe in my product. You're going to call me eventually. So um, what I want to hear is I want to know your story. I want to, I want to hear where you're from and, you know, what got you into this business? You know, I mean, I, I, I've thought about often as uh, writing a book one day and start interviewing everybody on the road, you know, how'd you get started? Where are you at? Um, another, another demographic that's popping up really good is the, uh, uh, the Arab culture, uh, Arab. And now thank God I, I had 10 years of my life in the Middle East. So I speak a little bit of Arabic. Um, and I've met quite a few that are very interested in the cigar industry, uh, and have been in the business for a while. And I've shared my passion with them. I, uh, I have been, it's been very, I've been very, uh, happy to share their first cigars with a lot of Arab cigar shop owners. So, uh, yeah. So that's another demographic that is, uh, booming right now. Uh, so. Um, yeah, so it, uh, most of the shops are like bodega style. You know, you're talking about your lottery stores and where they sell. So that's how I started. I, that was my focus is going to those stores. And as a cigar rep, they had never seen a cigar rep before. And so I would walk in and say, hey, hello, salam alaikum. And, uh, you know, I, I had the running joke. They would look at me and say, are you Muslim? I said, I'm half Muslim. <laughs> they would ask me, why? How are you half Muslim? And I said, well, I still eat bacon in the morning. I'm almost there. And uh, so I figured if they were going to laugh their ass off, then I'm in. <laughs> and if they kick me out of the store, then I'm probably not in. Nobody's kicked me out yet. So um, and and just uh, and, you know, and 
you know, from what my lessons I learned in the Middle East is Arabs are very, very, very good at reading body language. You know, they're very good at it. So they'll know right away you're not sincere. And, uh, and I'm very sincere. I, I, I want to know what's going on. And so your challenges. And so what I, what I started uh, when I did this, uh, this is how I learned about the demographics is I would go into a small little convenience store, kind of bodega, you know, they would have one or two cabinets on the side, but they're also selling chips and sodas and everything else. Uh, to me, I, I differ. I, I mean, I, I imagine this is where uh, myself and a lot of people in the industry probably differ on how we see things. A lot of people uh, believe that, you know, this is a this is a gentleman's game and it should be staying in the cigar lounges and everything. I don't believe that. I believe that the, the premium cigar should be in everybody's hands. So where are blue collar guys going after work on the way home? You know, uh, when they're not going to cigar lounges, where are they going? They're driving down the store, pick up a couple cigars, you know, from the, you know, from the guy they sell around the corner, the neighborhood store when they're selling, uh, they got some milk there. They got lottery tickets and chips and sodas. Well, they also got cigars. So my job was to go in there and, uh, show them how to manage those cigars, you know, how to properly manage their humid humidification system how to merchandise uh, that I would advise them on uh, what to sell and what not to sell. You know, uh, I, I always advise them just stick to the top 10, you know, uh, you know, don't go. Uh, I always advise them. Don't, don't buy anything. You know, somebody comes in and says, Hey, I want uh, something, 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 Liga Provada, whatever, exclusive 19 night, whatever. Don't buy it because uh, the guy will probably never come back. Uh, you want to be able to make money. I teach them how to make money. And also at the same time, be passionate about it. So, um, and, um, and I, I got a personal thing. If you're not going to be passionate about it, if I come in there and, uh, you just treat me like I'm your employee, I won't go back. You know, that's not what I'm doing. I'm developing relationships. And so, but I, I have a very good success rate of having a lot of people passionate about this. Well, it's interesting so, you mentioned that about the, um, that kind of thought that it's a gentleman's thing. Like, I imagine that these bodega type places are, are buying their cigars like through brokers, brokerages. Yep. And, mm -hmm. you know, by you being a rep going in and like working with them, that, that's kind of a, a whole other problem for them. And, and yeah. to bring them higher quality cigars to offer yeah. them we were the first. We were the first company to do it. So, um, yeah, that was, that was uh, my boss's brainchild. That was what he needed. That's what he wanted. So, um, you know, being a wholesaler, we were able to offer them those cigars. And uh, and we, we don't price, price gouge, so we were pr primarily pretty much the same price as all the others. Uh, these guys, uh, not only do they not have the resources uh, or the, the connections to call all the different companies, manufacturers in Miami, they don't have time for it either. Uh, and so... I, I save them time by doing that for them. So and now, these kind of guys like, that are running these bodega type places, I mean, I imagine that the cigar part of their business is, is a smaller percentage of their revenue. You know, um, at first, yes, industry? until they realize how valuable it is. Okay. Um, so I, uh, I gave a half-ass guarantee. <laughs> I pretty much said, let me make you money. Let me show you. And I promise you, you will. So, uh, and it's a simple thing. It's just, uh, you know, most of these guys don't have walk-ins. They have cabinets, and I, I like cabinets. Um, so it's a simple thing is how you arrange your cigars. You know, it's a feng shui. You know, you don't want a giant box here, small box here, giant box here. You don't want the big-ass box on the top shelf where you can't see the cigars. You know, really, really simple things that they don't really have time to think about. And I'll help them, and most of the time I would reset I, w I would schedule a time to come in, and I would do it in a complete reset for them, everything. Oh, wow. And but, and I wouldn't charge a dime. <laughs> I just requested that you order your cigars from me, and they they always did. Uh, it was a high success rate. Went to started about twenty three accounts to about one hundred seventy of those accounts. Wow. Um, so uh, going back to when we started this interview, um, I mentioned that uh, the reason Agonorsa hired us was because uh, we were already selling their product. And I was selling our core product to those guys because they needed something to sell that was an everyday pricing. I mean, seven dollar cigar. You know, uh, our bundles were. I don't know if you've ever tasted our new Cuba bundles. 
uh, the short pillar. Uh, I like to I like to mess with a lot of lounges. I'll take the uh, the band off, and I'll say, "Hey, we got a new blend. Can you try this?" And they have no idea that it's from our bundle. And I'll get this guy smoking our New Cuba Maduro bundle, the shop manager, and he'll notes of cherry, notes of this, and there, you know, everything else. And I'll say, "Well, listen, man, what do you think we should retail that for?" I get eight dollars, ten dollars, twelve dollars. I said, "Well, how about three dollars?" And he said, what do you mean? I said, dude, this is the scar. I just tried to sell you that you say you didn't want. <laughs> so, uh, so, and I, I, uh, I really, uh, helped a lot of, uh, um, you know, I, 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 I placed a lot of those bundles and, and not just me, of course. I mean, uh, we had a team, I, I was the, 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 the guy on the ground, but I have a whole support team, you know, back in my warehouse that uh, put it, you know, they worked their asses off by running and putting all these things together and getting it out so they, these guys can get it the very next day. So, um, yeah. All right. So, uh, one more thing that I'm curious to know, like, so sure. you mentioned about you're working with a lot of new lounges and stuff, is mm -hmm. what are your thoughts for new, the people that are interested in starting their own shop or lounge, what advice do you normally give? Don't. <laughs> uh... <laughs> That's the same advice I got when I, uh, my dream when I retired from the Air Force was to open up my own cigar lounge in Brooklyn, New York. Okay. Um, uh, after Afghanistan, I used to go to Brooklyn often. Uh, it was kind of like my Zen moment. I would just sit on the cart bench and people watch and smoke cigars. I loved it. I would drive from South Carolina to Brooklyn just to do that. And by doing that, I met a lot of people. That's actually how I met my wife. Um, so, um, <laughs> Now, so my, my big dream was to have that. Uh, I don't know if you've ever seen Smoke with Harvey Keitel, the movie. Um, so my dream was to have that little corner cigar, cigar store in Brooklyn, New York. It was a big dream. I had no idea what I was doing. No idea what I was looking into. Uh, that's where I met Jose Padron. Uh, Jeffrey Padron, Jose's grandson, introduced me to his grandfather. And on a Saturday, he gave me a lot of advice, a full day of advice. And that's when I decided not to do it. <laughs> Uh, I was not ready. I had no idea what I was getting myself into. Okay. Uh, so, uh, and I say that because uh, to a lot of people, and I get asked this question if you just ask me quite often, uh, it's a romantic idea to have a cigar shop. You know, um, uh, it's, it's work. It's very hard work. Uh, so, if somebody wants to do it, by all means do it, but please plan on putting in your 14 hour days, seven days a week, you know, uh, plan on, uh, always, uh, having a backup to a backup to a backup plan, you know? Um, so it's not, uh, you know, uh, and I, and other people, I tell them, listen, if you want to do, if you really want to do that, partner up with somebody, not as financial, but as a mentor, Go to somebody you trust in this industry, like Raul. Uh, go to somebody you trust and say, listen, I want to open up a cigar lounge. You know, what can you tell me? And those are the people to really ask, people that are successful in this. And ask them, hey, this is what I'm thinking about doing. This is what I'm looking at. And let them look at your business plan. Let them look. Most of these guys will, will be happy to do that for you. And, and that's what I did. And uh, that's when I had to be realistic with myself, saying I was not ready. I had a uh, lofty dream of just sitting in a cigar shop, smoking cigars all day, bullshitting with people in there, and that was it. You put a cash register on the thing, and you're ready to go. Uh, that's not it at all. And, uh, you know, talking about those bodegas, I set up about five to seven new stores a year from scratch. I get called, and I come in there, and uh, I'll help them set everything up. And, you know, uh, it's not easy. It's not easy at all. Uh, so I would, uh, I guess the main advice from everything I just said, take away from that would be, uh, find a mentor and, uh, have a good business plan, find a mentor. Uh, don't do it on the fly. Um, I've seen, I've seen so many cigar shops go under within a year. Um, because what happens is somebody retires, they got their buddies they say, Hey, we smoke cigars together. Let's get a place. They'll rent a place out. Have no idea what the what you know the city, you know, uh, requires of them. Don't know about anything and everything, and so then they're just uh, eventually they're they're hit in the face with uh, reality. So um, 
So definitely, that's what I would say. Find a mentor, you know, and, and be prepared to hear things you don't want to hear. When I like a lot of when you say the romance of, of cigar shops, I mean a lot of people have the romance of coffee shops as well. Yeah. Just mm-hmm. like saying it, it's so much more yeah. worth than than you would expect from. It's a lot of cups of coffee you got to sell to make that rent, right? Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. All right then. Well, thank you very much, Mike. I really appreciate. Oh, my pleasure, my friend. Man. Yeah, my pleasure. Been a great pleasure. Yeah, man. So. Look forward to you coming to, t- to town and we can get together. Yeah. Absolutely, brother. I'll give you a heads up. We'll smoke some cigars over at uh, uh, Tobacco Leaf. Sounds great. All right. Well, yeah. thanks, man. Thanks for tuning in. I really appreciate you taking time with us. Uh, you bet, brother. All right. right. You bet. You too. See ya. All right. See ya. All right. And that was Mike King. He came in from uh, out there in Pittsburgh. Thanks for tuning in, Mike. Really appreciate you spending the time with us. And for all of you who took the time all of you who took the time to spend with us this evening, that was the Agonorsa Leaf Rare Leaf Reserve. Rarely Reserve Robusto, and a beautiful cigar, really lovely flavors, nice chocolatey cacao, espresso, a little bit of cedar, and then there's this nice like citrusiness to it that comes from that that uh, that that leaf where they get that saltiness. Really pretty cigar. So thanks for tuning in. That was another Thursday here on um, on coffee and cigars on the the live stream. Coming up next week on May twentieth, we're going to be uh, smoking the Esteban Carreras Mister Brownstone. And then the 27th, I'm not sure what we're going to be doing yet because I might be away. And But we plan, I, I'm planning, even if I go away, I will be planning to do a, a live stream as well. And then on June 3rd, the Henry Clay Warhawk. Then June 10th, we'll be doing the Zeno Nicaragua Toro. So that's what's coming up. Of course, get those cigars from Tobacco Leaf and Jessup. We're always there to take care of you of everything you need. And it's also a great lounge to check out. And um, otherwise, I really appreciate you spending the time with us again. And if you happen to be watching the live stream, drop your comments in, in uh, down below. Let us know what you think. If you had the Aganosa Rare Leaf Reserve, make sure you give it a try if you haven't had it yet. It's a wonderful smoke. And um, and also be looking for Mike when he comes to your, to your area or if you're not in the Baltimore, you know, D.C., Pennsylvania, Jersey, Delaware area. Uh, whenever Aganosa comes out to do their, um, their events in your local area, they're going to have the Fumas. And the Fumas are a really great way to explore and experience the different tobaccos the um, from Esteli and Jalapa. So, um, all right, so thank you for tuning in. Be back again next week on Thursday night again at 8 p.m. So have a great one. <laughs>